Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. To Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Good evening, Fade to Black, Bespoke Radio for the masses. Yeah, man. <laughs> Today's Wednesday, November 8th. 312 days into the new year, just 53 days left, people. We are live from a bunker somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. And I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and tither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the planet. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? It's going to be one of those nights tonight. A classic fade to black with William Henry. That's right. We're going to discuss the recent discoveries in Egypt, Giza, the Great Pyramid. He also just got back from France with his wife, Claire. So we're going to talk about what he did over there, what they found, that research. Tomorrow night is another Fader Night open lines all night long with John Rappaport here and his No More Fake News Room Live. The call in numbers are 323-825-0445 or 323-275-9695. us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Facebook, YouTube, you know what to do. There's three little buttons over there on the website. Go click on them, follow, like, and subscribe. If you want to hang out in the sandbox, that is hashtag F2B on Twitter. We use Tweet Deck. If you have any questions or comments during the show tonight, hashtag F2BQ. You can also email throughout the show. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Very simple. All right. Let's see here. Where am I at? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. The podcast. Uh, the next late night podcast star contest, courtesy of your friends over at Tascam Pro. Uh, go over to our website if you would like to enter full contest rules. Click on the top of the page. Go to Game Changer. That'll take you right there. How to enter, what links to click on, what to do. Um, three, four, maybe five basic rules for this contest, and then everything else you can just check out yourself. But yeah, um, we're looking for the next late night podcast star, uh, talk radio. Uh, conspiracies and you know that that kind of thing whatever you want to do is up to you but you know you got to be in that genre okay now you got to live in the united states you got to give us three things you got to give us an audio recording of your podcast show idea you've got to pitch us you a, a podcast name artwork with logo in a nice banner uh, that you would use for website or promotion those three things are what you need to enter all entries by November 30th, 2017. We're going to pick somebody. Fade to Black is going to pick somebody. And what what is amazing here is, courtesy of Tascam Professional, you're going to get a complete podcast studio. With uh, Tascam Mini Studio Creator, you're going to get headphones, you're going to get your microphone, you're going to get the cables, everything you need to make the best, most professional podcast that you can. That's it. Okay, so enter the podcast contest, and uh, it's 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 there for those that have wanted to do this and just didn't have the ability to get it done. That's what we are here for. We're going to pick somebody. Somebody is going to get broadcasted. Their first podcast is going to be right here on the Game Changer Network. 
So go and enter the contest today. Deadline is November 30th. Lots of great entries so far. I'm telling you, competition is stiff. Don't think you can just, just you know, phone it in and just walk your way through this. No. Competition is stiff. And we will pick a winner. So there you go. Okay. Uh, Unity Workshops is starting, uh, has started their production of their first series of podcasts. And podcasting has taken over the world, isn't it? It's just absolutely amazing um, how easy it is. Everybody has had this inside of themselves wanting to get out. There's a podcast for anything, any any hobby, anything, any news, anything at all. There's a podcast out there for it. And uh, uh, probably thousands, right? It's taking over. And we're going to give you the ability to do that. And if you just want to come over and hang out with the team and and get started right now, go over to Unity. It's, it's very simple. Theunityproject.org. Sign up. We're looking for video and audio testimonials. We're looking for producers. We're looking for writers. It's a whole series of podcasts that we are going to be doing and broadcasting. And so you want to get in on it. It's very simple. Theunityproject.org. You can contact John at modernmasters.org or Rita right here at jimmychurchradio.com. Very simple. We need your help. This is a community project, and it's moving along, but we've got lots of podcasts to do, so come and hang out with us. Where would you get that picture, Rita? Hold on for a second. I got I to, gotta, where, what, where was that? I don't even know where that was taken. Interesting. Okay, anyway, podcasting, yeah, man, taking over the world, right? And uh, our next event, by the way, and uh, will be at the Conscious Life Expo, February 9th through the 12th, 2018, at the LAX Hilton. Tickets and info at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Very simple, www.ConsciousLifeExpo.com. And um, the thing is, this is one of the biggest events of the year. And certainly for the uh, conscious uh, community, uh, the awakening community, it is uh, quite possibly the biggest event of the entire year anywhere in the United States. And it, it's a great event. Floors, rooms, just uh, it's so much going on at any given time. But uh, we're going to be there. River Moon Coffee is going to be there. Uh, New Farm is going to be there. Ronnie McMullen and Life Change T are all going to be there. Uh, George Norrie is going to be there. Uh, Will Cock, uh, Corey Good, uh, Linda Moulton Howe. Uh, I can go on. Danian Brinkley is going to be there. You want to go hang out with Danian, don't you? I'm posting it up right here. Conscious Life Expo. There it is. Boom. And uh, you can go and uh, tickets and info and everything are right there. Okay. So I should have had that ready to go in the tweet, but I didn't. So there it is. You guys can go and click on the link. Hopefully that's a good link, right? It is. Uh, there it is. Okay, that's a good link. <laughs> it's called fast typing, right? Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast. We have over 750 archive shows right there for the picking. Custom apps, Apple, Android, all platforms, just $2 a month. Just go to jimmychurchradio.com, click on the podcast banner. Two bucks, right? There you go. And uh, all platforms are there. Whatever you need, $2 a month, 750 archive shows. That's crazy. $2 a month. You can also become a fade or not, though, too, if you'd like. And uh, go over to our membership section on our website where you're going to get the bunker cam. I'm waving to everybody now in the bunker cam. How you doing? And uh, you can also, if you choose, you can get uh, commercial-free downloadable archives. You can become a full-on game changer, get T-shirts, hats, all that kind of stuff. Just head over to jimmychurchradio.com. Click on the membership uh, area. All right, and don't forget all of our sponsors here. I want to thank all of you for supporting the show uh, by visiting all of our sponsors like Life Change Tea, GetTheTea.com. I ju- you know what I did? Oh, I'm, I'm done. I had a, a huge glass of... Uh, Super T, super strength, uh, right before the show tonight. Just absolutely amazing. What was I eating with that? Oh, chicken wings. Chicken. So there you go, right? So <laughs> huge plate of chicken wings and a huge plate of wings and a big, huge, tall, ice cold glass of life change tea. So get yours, life change tea, new pharma, river moon coffee. 
uh, again, the best coffee in the world. It just, I'm, I'm looking every single day. Somebody sends me a picture of their river moon coffee or the life change tea, new manna. You know, I get it all the time. New pharma. I just love it. And, and also bearing optics, uh, night vision, new manna, new manna, spend over a hundred dollars and you get an autograph fade to black t-shirt. Yeah. And a discount. I mean, how cool is that? Bearing optics, same thing going on over there. Just mention Jimmy, when you order, you're going to get a discount. Alec Hoffman, he is a fade or not. So when you call and you speak with Alan at extension 105 over there, he's going to guide you through it and uh, get you exactly the pair of night vision uh, that you need. And and also, all of the fader knots, by the way, um, exclusively, you get the, uh, um, uh, what's the word, no, a smartphone, smartphone adapter that goes on to the night vision, right? So now you can watch the night vision through your cell phone, record it, Right, this is not available anywhere on Bearing Optics. It's not even for sale. You only get it through Fade to Black and the Fader Knots and that Fade to Black page over at Bearing Optics, the Area Fifty One Jimmy Church model, and it says it right there, approved by Fade to Black. So when you're there, you know you're on the right page, and you're going to get a cell phone adapter and a discount, and Alex expert advice on where to go and how to do it and what to choose. Okay, so there you go. Let's get the show cracking. Today, happy birthday to Parker Posey. Man, I couldn't wait to say that. Parker Posey, one of Rita and I's favorites, uh, one of the funniest out there, period. 49 years old today. Happy birthday, Parker. Um, Almost made her screen debut very early on. She was in Dazed and Confused. Ben Affleck, right? Dazed and Confused, but... It, and and she's great in that too, by the way. But it was her run with um, uh, Christopher Guest, waiting for Guffman, best in show, a mighty wind for your consideration. She's just one of the funniest. Parker Posey, forty nine years old. On the stand, history OTD, and it was a big one. As a matter of fact, on this day in nineteen seventy one, the Earth shifted. It sh- shifted it shifted in 1971 on this day led zeppelin releases led zeppelin 4 seriously led zeppelin 4 that man 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 you got your van halen one right <laughs> i mean you know very uh, i mean records that changed everything led zeppelin 4 unbelievable 1971 Fader fact. Now, Rita vetted this today, and it is so incredible. It's one of those fader facts that you have to uh, you have to vet. It's incredible. Aldous Huxley, writer of Brave New World, asked for LSD on his deathbed in 1963. That's right. Huxley died hallucinating. And that is a fader fact. Tonight, very special guest with us, William Henry is here. We're going to discuss the recent discoveries over in Egypt and, of course, all of his latest research with himself and his wife, Claire. And I, you know what? One of these nights, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask, well, I want Claire on the show. You know, I want Claire on the show. She's absolutely amazing. But anyway, we're going to talk about all of their latest research. And tomorrow night is another Fader Night open lines all night long. John Rappaport's going to be here with his No More Fake News room live. Okay. Now, um, I need to discuss something. Now, look, I have an open mind. We all know that. I, I just love to learn. I will listen to everything, no matter how simple complicated, outrageous, not outrageous, you know, whatever, bland. I, you know, I listen to it all. I do. I'm in a constant learning phase, right? <laughs> like Huxley <laughs> taking acid on his deathbed. I learned something today and so did you. So I'm always, I'm always, you know, uh, wanting to take things further. And, but there's some things I just won't do. 
I, I, I won't do it. Flat Earth, for instance. You know, we did one Flat Earth show. That was enough. You know, I just don't need to go there anymore. I've done my discovery. But um, over the last, I'm going to say three months, going back uh, before September, so uh, back into August, I've uh, been getting email and comments and posts and so forth about, uh, you know, the earth ending. You know, the, you know, the world's coming to an end. Nibiru is going to be here. We're going to do this. And, the, and, and then last month it started with uh, the 15 days of darkness that were coming in November. When am I going to do a show on it? When am I, I don't need to do a show on it. Are you, are you being serious? Now, I remember, I remember going back probably, this is 2017, so let's go back five, six years, that I remember hearing about this. And it went all over the internet, and I was getting bombed with it, and people asking me about it back then. And, of course, there were no 15 days of darkness in November, and and the rumors continued And here we are again now in 2017, the very, very same rumor is flying around the Internet, and I'm getting the emails. You know, when am I going to do a show about it? What do I think about it? What do I think is really going on? What do I think is causing it? And look, um, is there going to be 15 days of darkness in November, starting next week on November 15th? The answer is no. (laughs) There is not going to be. Any darkness <laughs> that isn't already supposed to be there, probably for the rest of your life. Okay, so you can relax there. Is there going to be any darkness in November? Yeah, at night. Okay. All right. All right. Now, because all of this started um, uh, with a website uh, called, uh, man, what was it? Man, Newswatch 33. Now, Newswatch 33, um, even I on this show uh, started to get people would send me links to Newswatch. You've got to check this out, man. You know, this this website. And and I spent like one or two days on it. And I talked about it on this show three years ago, maybe four years ago, for everybody just to ignore this fake website. And I used those terms back then. Newswatch 33 was taken offline. And they were replaced by their equally fake uh, website. Man, it was called uh, Newswatch Newswatch Twenty Nine or something. I can't I can't remember. And uh, but anyway, back then in 2015, somebody started sending me these links, and they had published an article. So I went back and looked, and sure enough, NASA confirms Earth will experience 15 days of complete darkness in November 2015. And the original article said this, and I happen to find it. NASA has confirmed, I'm quoting here, NASA has confirmed that the Earth will experience 15 days of total darkness between November 15th and November 29th, 2015. The event, according to NASA, hasn't occurred in over 1 million years. Astronomers from NASA have indicated that the world will remain in complete darkness starting on Sunday, November 15th, 2015 at 3 a.m. and will end on Monday, November 30th, 2015 at 4.15 p.m. According to officials, the November blackout, quoting here, event will be caused by another astronomical event between Venus and Jupiter. And the article ends with Charles Bolden, who was appointed to head uh, NASA by President Obama, issued a 1,000-page document explaining the event to the White House, end quote. So that was the, that was, that's what went around the web, and that was courtesy of Newswatch 33 back in 2015. Freaked everybody out, right? Okay, so I researched it back then. Charles Bolden, turns out he's a real guy, all right? But the same exact text that I just read to you is what is cir- you know circulating around the internet right now with just 2017 inserted there right and Trump okay so now NASA has delivered a top secret 1000 page report from Charles Bolden <laughs> explaining the event to the Trump White House 
right? And now, same date, same time, same everything. And and I I get it. You know, people read that and they're shocked. Now, look, let's discuss a couple of things. What, my friends, what would cause a total blackout, darkness? Okay, well, let's take a few things off of the list before we get to what could cause it. Let's take something off of the list. First off, some alignment that happens every year with Venus and Jupiter, right? Somewhere it happens. Uh, Jupiter's small. It's not going to block out the sun. Um, so there's that. Venus getting in between. Uh, you know, the whole concept is 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 scientifically unsound. So is it, is it Jupiter and Venus? Uh, no. Okay, so let's – and that's what they're saying it's going to be, some some event, right? Okay, well, it's not going to be Jupiter and Venus. So you can move that off. Of the, it happens every year. There has been no darkness in history <laughs> going back a million years ago caused by Venus and Jupiter. Okay, so take that off of the list. But what else could cause complete darkness for 15 days? Well, the only way that complete darkness could happen, and the the key word here is complete, darkness all over the world, is the sun has to turn off. <laughs> for 15 days. All right? Sun has to turn off. That that so that's not going to happen. It hasn't happened in the past. Jupiter's not going to cause the sun to turn off. Uh Venus So anyway, the sun would have to turn off. That would cause complete darkness. And if it did happen, a uh, complete darkness for 15 days, it would get a bit chilly, wouldn't it? Hopefully uh uh, you've got enough uh, portable gas heaters and and enough blankets and pillows and and thermal underwear to to get you through it. It's going to get a little nippy, but uh, but anyway, the sun would have to go out. So there's that. Now, if the sun isn't the culprit here and the sun is going to stay lit, then the only thing that would cause darkness wouldn't be complete darkness. No, our Earth, in case. Nobody knows this fact, but I'm going to let you know. Our our Earth rotates. Yeah, it does. Rotates. So every 24 hours, we have a day. And as it rotates, <laughs> I'm not talking down to anybody, I hope. I'm just having fun. As it rotates past the sun, half of the Earth is lit up. And the other half is in night, right? Okay. So the Earth would have to stop. Turning. Now, how long would that take? You know, it would slow down, or would it, would it just stop at a thousand miles an hour, right? And just stop and throw everything off the table, flat earthers. So, um, but let's say that let's go with option number two. Now, it's not complete darkness though, because half of the Earth for fifteen days is going to roast like a turkey in in an oven. Fifteen days of sunlight. So let's say it's, you know, uh, the United States is on the opposite side, and the United States is in complete darkness for 15 days. But it's not complete darkness, all right? Half of the earth is lit up. So that kind of takes that off the table. But this is the strange thing. What happens after 15 days? The earth is going to start rotating again? Is that because of Jupiter and Venus? Ah, never mind. I'm not smart enough to figure that part out, but... But but so the Earth's going to then start rotating again and we'll slowly get back to normal. Uh, think about the lit up side. It's really hot. The cold side, the dark side is going to be really cold 15 days. But that's option number two. There isn't a third option here to cause complete darkness because Jupiter is too small. Venus is really too small, so there's nothing there that the two of them are going to do to cause this darkness. And this is the and this is where things get strange for me. To, for me to get um, email about this, this audience is smart, and the person that is sending me the email is also smart. But what does it take? 
What does it take to twist somebody up enough for them to be motivated to send me an email? Right? Now, I got, uh, uh, I've got this right here in front of me. Uh, let me pull this up right here. I'm not going to say the name. Uh, but this is, this is what I got. Hi, Jimmy. I know you are, I, I know you are a busy guy, but I don't know who else to ask. I was wondering what you know about the 15 days of darkness predicted for November 15th through the 30th, 2017. I've been researching it all morning. It came to me last night via a friend. Have you heard anything about it? I don't. I, I don't know to try and prepare or how to try and prepare or just blow it off. You do so many shows and you are connected with so many people. I figured I would ask you. You have. Do you have time to get back to me? That would be very appreciated. Thank you so much. Now, I know this person. And I'm just thinking, what, how, 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 how do we get here? <laughs> how do we get here? I'm not laughing at this person. I'm laughing at the, the, you know, it, a little bit of research is one thing. And I, and I get that. It's the fact that somebody out there every year, this has surfaced every year, somebody out there is changing the dates and reposting it for fun. Some people don't think it's funny and they take this serious. You know, and I know that there are grins and laugh and, and, and funny things going on behind the scenes when that stuff gets posted and released and put on a website. But there are people out there that take that stuff serious. You know, so look, it's never gone dark. It's not going to go dark. The earth is not going to stop turning. The sun isn't going to go black. And Jupiter isn't big enough to do diddly squat. So I can assure you with 110% certainty that for the rest of your life, I can't speak past that, but I'm pretty sure that for the rest of your life and for the rest of my life, ain't none of that stuff going to (laughs) happen. That's it. That's my prediction, and I'm going to stick to it. And for once, for once, a prediction is actually going to come true. Mine. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight. The one and only William Henry, right here. It's going to be a little bit, uh, it's going to be a lot of Egypt, a little bit of France, and mostly William. It's going to be one of those nights. I'm really looking forward to this. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church, Bespoke Radio for the masses on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. I'll be right back with our guest. William Henry. Stay right there. Listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net, KGRA Radio. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black. You create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights. Just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go Beckley Tepe. 
So are you tired of being tired? Well, then it's time to get the tea. Hey, it's Lisa here to tell you about this all-natural, all-organic tea I've been drinking that has had great results for over 20 years. It's called Life Change Tea, and it's specially formulated to help detoxify and cleanse your kidneys, liver, colon, and blood all at once. The colon is one of the most ignored organs in the human body. The faster that waste is eliminated from the body, the less time that waste sits in our intestines, spreading toxins to our bloodstream. This tea helps cleanse chemicals caused by outside intruders from our entire digestive system. And get this, weight loss can be a side effect. And with continued use of the tea, you can experience clear, healthier, younger looking skin, increased energy, and a happier outlook on life. So if you're tired of being tired, get the life change tea at getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. And like me, you'll be glad you did. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Win big with KGRA this summer. Tickets and hotel accommodations to the biggest conferences, autograph books and DVDs, chances to win all-inclusive conference cruises, and private dinners with your favorite KGRA hosts. Click the contest tab at KGRARadio.com for your chance to win big this summer. Your contact for the best alternative talk radio on the planet. KGRARadio.com. This is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Jimmy Church Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Block. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA, the planet, you can follow me right now on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Very simple. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. All the chat rooms are open. You can come hang out there, too, as well. Now that Twitter's up to 280 characters, I don't know. You know, that was always the complaint, right? Man, I'm in the chat rooms because I can't do it with 140. Well, now you got 280. So there you go. All right. Our guest tonight, William Henry. One of our favorites. William is a Nashville-based author, investigative mythologist, and TV presenter. He's an internationally recognized authority on human spiritual potential, transformation, and ascension. His, he has a unique ability to incorporate historical, religious, spiritual, scientific, archaeological, and other forms of such knowledge into factually based theories and conclusions that provide the layperson with a more in-depth understanding of the profound shift we are actually experiencing in our lifetime. The spiritual voice and consulting producer of the global hit History Channel program, Ancient Aliens, and the host of Gaia TV series, The Awakened Soul, The Lost Science of Ascension, and Arcanum. Along with his wife, Claire, William is your guide in the transformative sacred science of human ascension. With over 30 years of research distilled into 18 books and numerous video presentations, William's work will guide you to the next level of human consciousness and our expanding reality. Along with his wife, Claire, he leads luxury Ascension-themed tours to sacred sites, including Egypt, France, Italy, and England. Tonight, we're going to discuss, amongst other things, the recent discovery of the chamber above the Grand Gallery of the Great uh, Pyramid in Giza, as well as uh, his recent return from France and all of his latest research and his missions. And I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only and ultimately well-dressed gentleman, William Henry. William, how are you? Wonderful, Jimmy. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you, everybody, for listening. I'm going to start with this, my good friend. How is Claire? Claire is wonderful. Thank you so much for asking. I, I just I just had to. You guys are the best, and I'm only asking because the next time around, Claire's going to be the guest on the show. I'm sorry, William. <laughs> she was actually chomping at the bit to talk to you tonight. She was she was on it. Man, man, man. Uh, uh, last summer, uh, Claire and I had, I don't know. You know what? Am I disclosing something right now? I don't even know if Rita knows or you know. Claire and I talked uh, a couple of times for 
at length. I don't even know. I think one day we talked for a couple of hours. And I hung up the phone, and I was changed. <laughs> you were clarified. I was changed, man. Oh, man. She is she is just awesome. You're blessed. So I am, truly. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, I don't know where to start, but uh, I, I, I am going to go here first. Did you ever find your necklace? <laughs> yes, I did. Thank you for oh, asking. Oh, no, I got to know. Where was it? It was hidden away well beyond my prying eyes. Are you kidding? You, do you know no. what, uh, You know the panic, the look on your at everybody, right? was just like, hey, man, he's not wearing the necklace. And to say, yeah, it was, it was funny. But, um, yeah, I, I do have it back, and I'm uh, very happy to, to announce that it's doing well. Okay. All right. So now next... We're going to see you um, at uh, the Conscious Life Expo. So I, I do want to say it's always great to have you out there and to have us all together. But we're going to be doing uh, another panel together out there. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, and I, I really, really, really look forward to that. And I'll be able to, uh, you know, maybe procure your necklace at that event. And we'll do that for everybody on the live stream. <laughs> what do you say? Yeah. Well, we'll see, Jimmy. We'll okay. just have to see. But I'm very much looking forward to the Conscious Life Expo. So always such an exciting event, great way to kick off the year, wonderful lineup of speakers. And I don't know, it just seems like every year the intensity just ratchets it up. And uh, here we are again, another another year of, uh, coming ahead that's going to be, I'm sure, very explosive. And we're going to talk about all of that. Um, and before we get started, I've now said that for the three times, but... Um, I started to think about uh, you and ancient aliens today and thinking about how long that show now is on the air and how long it has been. You've been a part of it. Did you have any idea that we would be in 2017 talking about a new season uh, of ancient aliens? No, absolutely not. I mean, it was it, it's, it's fans of the show know it started out just as a three episode special they turned into a season and now it's the 11th season and and here we are going deeper than than ever before and it just goes to show there's just this insatiable desire for people to know and they want to gather around a uh, a flame and that an ancient aliens is is that light it's one of them anyway yeah it certainly is and one of the things that i appreciate uh about ancient aliens and yourself is the way that the series and you have dealt with Egypt. And for for the war, if you think about it, William, the millions of people that Ancient Aliens reaches, we're all fascinated with King Tut and the gold and and and, and things and Cleopatra. That that's the world that, you know, they're fascinated with Egypt. But they have been introduced to a whole nother side, different sites different sacred things, uh, the geometry of what's going on, and certainly uh, the possibility of an alien connection there. But uh, ancient aliens and yourself have been part of exposing the world to this, and they would have never known. I really appreciate that effort there. But isn't hasn't that been an extraordinary part of it for you? Well, totally, and there's so much more we, we want to do. Uh, but given the limitations of uh, the, the time frame when we're producing, it's very difficult to to, to set up shoots in Egypt just because it takes so long to do so. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right. Uh, from Abydos and looking at the Osirian, looking at uh, what we find at Saqqara and other sites, Ancient Aliens is really giving people a, an insider's look at, at Egypt that they otherwise probably wouldn't be able to get is there an end is there an end to the information out of egypt is it, it, it's ongoing isn't it it's just the gift that keeps on giving oh totally and it's it's one of those things you can spend a whole lifetime studying any aspect of the egyptian mysteries pick a temple and spend a lifetime there and you still wouldn't know it all and that's what kind of makes it so exciting is you just really have to you have to take a look at, at, at as big a picture as you possibly can, but then ultimately you want to start getting down to the micro level too. For example, I just I have locked onto Abydos as a as a site that I absolutely love visiting every time we're there. It's an endless source of of mysteries, and 
one day I know that there's going to be even more mind-blowing discoveries at Abydos, and that's what keeps a lot of people interested in Egypt, is that you know that we're just only on the outer edge of what's actually there. You know, that's when it comes to Abydos, Abydos, uh, and for the audience, I mean, we can get into it a little bit for sure, but Abydos was nearly forgotten in that they thought that they had discovered everything there, it was already done, the digs were done, and it was just kind of on the back burner. And the discoveries that have come out of Abydos in the last 20 years have been some of the most groundbreaking, history-changing things ever. And it was only because they went back and took a second look. Yeah, exactly. And that's what we have to do continually with Egypt is check what we check what we learn and look at it from different perspectives. And that's what makes the, the new discovery at, at Giza so exciting is that they they ventured out of the box. They weren't looking at it through an, an Egyptologist lens. They were looking at it through a scientific lens. And here we are talking about an amazing discovery in, in Egypt once again. Well, um, you know what? Let's go there right now. When they first started the project uh, last year, I thought, this is what I thought. Probably you had the same thought. Well, this isn't going to go anywhere, right? And they they leaked a couple of things. There were some anomalies. You remember the little heat things that were on the outside and the possibility of a, a couple of chambers and a couple of hot spots. And I thought, okay, that's a teaser, but it's not going to go anywhere. Did you really think that this kind of discovery would have happened last week? It's pretty amazing. It is amazing because... Again, it's it's not coming from the Egyptologist. This is one of the really great aspects of it, is that finally you've got scientists who are looking at it, coming at it from just a, a cold perspective, a, a, a naive perspective, according to the Egyptologist, because they're not factoring in what we supposedly already know or think we know about the pyramid. And for them to bring something so crystal clear and and presenting what they what is being described as a mysterious void, but we know of as actually some kind of a chamber, uh, to, especially in presenting that to a global audience where suddenly people are locked on to the pyramid again. That's what makes it so exciting to me. I was driving uh, last week. I had read the announcement, uh, you know, probably at the same time you did last week. And I'm driving in the car, right, going to Costco, doing my thing. And uh, and I'm listening to talk radio, KFI out here in L.A. And they come back after the commercial with this. I almost crashed my car. I'm serious. Breaking news out of Giza, Egypt. They found a new chamber in the, the Great Pyramid. I was like, this is great. <laughs> you know, talk radio in Los Angeles. It wasn't politics for a change. Right. It, it was the chamber above uh, the, the Grand Gallery. And they really gave it some airtime. And and so you're absolutely right for the mainstream to go and run with this story. It's a really big deal for us. It is a big deal because to me, any, every time I'm in Egypt, I mean, there's always that moment. We usually arrive in Cairo at night, get out to the pyramids, our hotel by the pyramids at night. And the pyramids are, they've long since turned the lights off. And then there's that morning when you wake up in your hotel room and you pull back the curtains and you're looking at the Great Pyramid, and it's like you, you exhale, a big, deep exhale, and say, ah, oh, back to the real world. Yeah. You know, It's just this feeling that you know that those pyramids have been there how many thousands of years, and they represent what is true, what is ultimately almost eternal about humanity. And by studying them, by locking onto them, you are connecting with something deep within yourself. And so to, just to hear the, the world news people talking about it in the mainstream, phenomenal, phenomenal. We need more of that. Well, you know, Zahi, for years, there is nothing in the Great Pyramid. There is right, nothing. That he that... has an already <laughs> right, exactly. right, right, right. We know everything, you know. And so anyway, <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, uh, people are going to start the memes now. I can already see it popping up in Twitter. But you knew, you knew in your heart of hearts, you and Claire looking at the Great Pyramid, you knew that there was something else inside of there. There's probably a lot more, too. Oh, my gosh, yeah. You know that there's there's room for at least or around 47 King's Chamber-sized rooms in the Great Pyramid. You can look at it from certain perspectives, especially at night, and easily detect with the naked eye an, an entrance higher up near the, near the top of the pyramid. 
And that's part of the fun of, of being there is just trying to, to visualize and connect what actually is inside there. And in fact, you know, people have been speculating for at least 15 years that uh, about the existence of, of, of this chamber. In fact, my webmaster, Mark Foster, has written articles about it. He was He's long been looking into this, and so it wasn't a surprise to him. And he said, hey, you know, it's it's pretty much been known when you look at what's known as the trial passages outside of the Great Pyramid, just uh, about 80 yards or so from the entrance that, that most people enter into, or, or the only entrance to the Great Pyramid, but the, the, the area that most of the, the tourists hang out around. They're always walking by this area where they that you can see a mock-up, literally, a, or an attempt to mock up the layout of the internal passages in the pyramid. And Mark has long since maintained that those trial passages have told us there's there's another chamber above the Grand Gallery. So to have it actually verified is is really truly astounding, and it opens up the the, the possibility that hey, this, the speculation that there are yet even more hidden chambers in the pyramid could equally be true. What do we know so far? How big is it? They're using terms, well, the, the, it's, it, the, the space's dis- dimensions are very close to what you find in the Grand Gallery, about 153 feet long. So that's a, about a good a small size passenger airplane is, is the comparison that they're making. So if the Grand Gallery is 153 feet long and 26 feet tall, that's probably a pretty good approximation to what this this space, this chamber, or this so-called void would actually be. Now, you've, you've been there. I have not. When mm-hmm. you go, now that you know that this is above the King's Chamber, you've been... It's actually above the Grand Gallery I mean, the, that, above, that leads above, into the King's Chamber. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, okay. you, you've been through the Grand Gallery so many times. As you look up, do you think that – can you speculate on, on on how you might be able to access this chamber? Do you think that there is an entrance? Has there been something that's always raised your eyebrow over the years? Well, again, I go back to my webmaster, Mark Foster, and, and his work where – He's shown that based on, again, these trial passages, it's like they left a key for us Mm -hmm. right outside the pyramid. It's like, here you go. You're trying to put together a puzzle, humankind. Here's the key to the puzzle, these trial passages. And based on that work, Mark has gone out to show that there's a... An entrance way, when you enter into the king's, when you enter into the pyramid, it's like you're going into a cave. And it's it's all cut out. It looks like it's been cut out from the inside out. And that's kind of a another kind of bit of the funny business of what, what you find there. Mm-hmm. But you, you enter into this into this cave like passage and then just as you go to the grand gallery, you're gonna go up this slope, this hundred and fifty foot long slope into the king's chamber, there is another passage called the descending passage that is right there at that point where you begin to ascend into the Grand Gallery. Mm -hmm. Mark thinks that there's a hidden entranceway, a passage, a vertical passage that goes right up into this new uh, gallery uh, above the Grand Gallery. So the entranceway, if if it were to speculate on how you would enter into it, it wouldn't be from the gal- Grand Gallery, more than likely. It would be from that entrance point where the Grand Gallery and the, ascend- and the descending passage meet. You're looking for this vertical passage that then would take you upward and into the pyramid. And so the, the, the possibility then would exist that once you get up into that passage, that there is, in fact, a, other passages that branch off into the other uh, hidden chambers higher up in the pyramid. What do you think? Now, this is, again, where you know I'm asking for speculation here um what do you think is it, it, the chamber is for is it you know we can look at it a couple of ways uh is it another version of the grand gallery for instance are those is there two of those stacked up is it something right. else is it is it a tomb is it some kind of religion is it uh, for uh transference uh, to the other side is there, there's some kind of uh a uh, book of uh, death involved here. I don't know. I mean, what do you think the chamber would be used for? Well, you're going to have to look at it from a practical perspective, and from the practical perspective, people are going to say it's a relieving chamber for the Grand Gallery. Like like what's above the King's Chamber? 
Yes, exactly. So that that's a, a that's a very practical function for it, and that's not to dismiss the possibility that there's something stashed within there as well. I mean, we don't know what was stashed in the king's chamber when it was discovered, or what was originally inside the grand gallery. I mean, I remember. Uh, Levin Zachari- Zachariah Sitchin's take that the Grand Gallery would have had all these crystals placed along the, in, in the niches along the way up. And who knows, maybe that, that's a possibility. And perhaps this, this pl- airplane-sized chamber that is above the Grand Gallery was also some kind of a storage facility for, for something. Or maybe it is just a, a relieving chamber for the, uh, for the Grand Gallery. We don't know, and that's part of the excitement. And it always it takes me back to this idea that the that that Egypt almost seems to have a plan for humanity, as if there's a a timetable that's been established for the rollout of these secrets and of these discoveries. And so here we are, all on the edge of our seats now, recognizing, okay, Egypt is is given us another clue, and so we just have to to, to follow it and open up our imagination and. Personally, I just can't wait to see where it goes. Yeah, you're going to be there in February, and I'm extremely jealous uh, uh, with the two of you. Um, But let me ask you this. Okay, so now, the entrance to the king's chamber, uh, let's just say facing the king's chamber is on the left, okay? The entrance is in the corner. The Grand Gallery is uh, is on a center axis uh, coming down. Now, wouldn't it make sense that on the right side of the king's chamber, opposite of the entrance to the king's chamber, right, the same wall, just on the other corner, that there would be an exit, right? And and maybe that's what's going on here. There would be the same descending and the same design, another parallel grand gallery next to it, because whoever went through the grand gallery— Brought everything in, did the trap doors, right? Right, did the trap doors, and, and now you're inside. You got five, six, seven, maybe a couple of dozen dudes stuck in the grand in the king's chamber. They got to get out. So, wouldn't they, you know, wouldn't you speculate that there would have been an exit point that they exited out of, you know, back out of the pyramid and then seal it back up? Sure. I mean, there's there's always the conversation, especially uh, in the Edgar Casey circles, about one of those granite blocks in the king's chamber being removable or eat more easily removable than the others, and that that in fact conceals a passage. So, I'm I'm game for anything like that. Absolutely, I think that that, that those are all good possibilities. Now, um, after reading Edgar Casey and some other researchers and, and stuff, when you were in the King's Chamber, did you look for said block? Did you try to move anything? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to... I'm Yes. Yes, no. Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> because... You have to be very careful what you say you actually do in in these sacred spaces in these temples and these structures in right. Egypt because they take it they take it very seriously they don't want anybody coming in there like bringing ladders in like those German guys did that Robert Baval had to help get out of prison and right. people do people do crazy things in, in the pyramids or in, in the in the generally in the temples in Egypt and especially in the king's chamber and my modus operandi when, when we're in the king's chamber, when we're in any of the temples, is to make sure that we're entering with the greatest respect possible. And I have made, I've done some really stupid things and, and, and nearly gotten into a lot of trouble um, in, in, in Egypt, crossing the line. And so I just always encourage people, hey, it's better to fly straight. Um, these, the, we're, we're guests in this country. We're explorers, and we want to leave it better than we found it. Does anything look discolored? Does any any of those uh, red granite blocks look, uh, you know, different from the others? Um, going by memory, you know, they're they're all kind of dark, and so they're originally pink granite, but they're they're all pretty dark. And again, there's that. That one on the left-hand corner is you're facing the the so-called sarcophagus that mm-hmm. is probably the most interesting. Yeah, that's the one that I'm talking about. And when you look at it in photographs, it's just like, come on, let's check that out. Right? It just, it's yeah, just exactly. like obvious. It's lit up. Exactly. And you know, whenever I'm in the king's chamber, um, I'm I'm always trying to get go silent 
connect with the space. My wife, Claire, she's always trying to, to connect with it by chanting. She's, she's bringing it alive. She's got a wonderful recording she calls the Great Pyramid Chant, where the pyramid was actually just like singing through her. My, Claire is not a singer, but suddenly when she's in the King's Chamber, her, this voice within her just came alive, and she produced this incredible chant that uh, even Dr. J.J. Hurtock, when he heard it, he said, oh, that's, that, that is definitely, that's the pyramid singing through you. And so it's, to me, it's always a space that has a consciousness to it. And you can connect with that consciousness through chanting, through meditation. And that, to me, is the, the great opportunity when you're in that space to, to be able to try to just to get your consciousness linked with this incredibly cosmic, expansive consciousness that built the pyramid. Now, um, the the orthodox Egyptologist way of uh, explaining the Great Pyramid is that it was the tomb. It was a tomb of Khufu. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's that's the open and closed book on that. If that's the, right. If this gallery uh, opens up, this chamber opens up, and something else points in the other direction off of Khufu, Maybe there's even hieroglyphics. Maybe there's something there to explain something. I don't know. We're all speculating. But let's say it it goes it points in the direction away from Khufu and away of uh, away from the tomb aspect. Do you think that they'll step up to the plate and 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 change their story? Well, one would hope so, but they're pretty dug in right now just based on the the response of Zahi Huwaz, who was, you, know, you wouldn't expect anything else from Zahi than to, for him to say that the discovery of this this void doesn't mean anything at all. And, you know, he's partly correct that there are many voids in the pyramid for construction reasons, but this one is special. It's clearly special. And you have to believe that there are government officials, there are other officials in Egypt that would recognize that for all humankind, we're ultimately looking and seeking the same thing, and that Egypt has an astounding opportunity here to to show the world something that would could actually bring about tremendous unity, that could, could bring about a, a sense of true wonder to humanity that we all really desperately need right now. So there's always this part of me that, that, that feels that the Egyptians would, in fact, be truthful and honest if they were to make a discovery such as you're describing. You're absolutely right. Let's take a break right here. I can already I can already hear Zahi. I do not believe in muons. There are no muons. <laughs> I kicked <laughs> Japan. I kicked Japan out of out of Egypt forever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, we laugh. We kid. Our guest tonight, William Henry. And now, when we come back, we're going to continue uh, this discussion on Giza. He is also going back in February uh, with Claire. We're going to talk about that as well and his recent trip to France. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with William Henry right after this short break. Stay with us. Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Hello, Fader Knots. This is Jimmy Church, and I'm introducing New Pharma, a company whose products are based on science, human function based on the endocannabinoid system. Or ECS. New Pharma firmly believes in this science, and their research indicates that support of the ECS provides the beneficial effects for a healthy lifestyle. New Pharma's science includes relief capsules for pain relief, sleep capsules, which are natural support for occasional sleeplessness, foundation is support for your ECS, and fit capsules support your active lifestyle. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B for a 33% discount on all of their products. Or visit newpharma.com for all of the knowledge on the science. That's gnupharma.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Hello, I'm and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. 
right, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black, on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> yes. We are of the Honey Sorry, Brothers. I can... Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. Ancient Life Oil. Life changing. The real oil. CBD is truly ancient life oil from the source. This oil has no psychoactive effect and is also legal in all 50 states. When you're healthy, you're happy. The truth about this wonderful plant is that it wants to give back to mankind life, longevity, and happiness. Ancient life oil are golden grade, all organic, non GMO, and infused with high quality liquid coconut oil. It's simple. Just go to ancient. AncientLifeOil.com today. That's AncientLifeOil.com. The best, purest, organic, and non-GMO CBD in the world. Go Backley Tappy. The statements made regarding these products have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Please consult your healthcare professional about potential interactions or other possible complications before using any product. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, The Planet. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at jchurchradio. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. On the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet, our guest tonight is William Henry. We're discussing all things Egypt, and then we're also going to get in some France. (laughs) We're going to get some France. Hey, William, I wanted to ask you something I've never asked um, of you before. The more that I research, uh, Rita and I, you've got Claire, I've got Rita. The more that that we research um, into Egypt, and especially with the Great Pyramid, I am not so confident about the dating now. I am very comfortable with going way back in time. Um, certainly 2650 B.C. is off the table, That, for me at least. Uh, what do you think we're dealing with uh, with the dating of the pyramid? Well, you, 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 first of all, when you're when you're in Egypt, you you get an opportunity. If you go from Cairo uh, in in Lower Egypt down to Upper Egypt, down to to Luxor, you look at Karnak, Abydos, Edfu, you get, you, yeah, Edfu, yep. Yeah, you you readily see the progression of the temples. You see the the layer cake, and you can with, very quickly get a, a sense of what was happening in various time periods. And so you get a look at get a look at 1500 BC, you get a look at 3000 BC, and you get a look at 2500 BC, 300 BC, as you mentioned at Edfu and and Dendera and elsewhere. Then you come back up to Giza, and you look at the Great Pyramid, and you go, okay, 25, 30,000, 50,000 years old? Right, right, right. You really can go there, and yeah, yeah. there's there's no evidence to support that, but you know it's at least 10,000 years old, and you know it doesn't match anything else that you've seen anywhere else. And it's so out of place, so completely different from everything else that you see, feel, or otherwise experience in Egypt that it just almost doesn't even belong there. The uh, You mentioned Edfu, and the thing is, uh, you know, the Temple of Horus, you know, that's 300 B.C., 400 B.C., 300 B.C. And mm-hmm. one would say, okay, we can dismiss that. That's the new, it, it's too new. You know, no, it, they uh, they took care there to, uh, to document the history of Egypt and to make sure that it was frigging in stone. And, right. And one of the points there... Yeah, that they do. They go back. They don't go back to Dynasty Zero. They go back to like the beginning of the world. 
right. And and that that's a whole nother. But they wanted to make sure that their documentation, which was allegedly at the time, which they described there, uh, was disintegrating. So they wanted to make sure that it was. I almost said cemented, but that's actually what they did. Um, and to document this, and it's we're talking about tens of thousands of years of history that is there. It, it doesn't just go back to Dynasty One or Zero or Menes or or Narmer. They went way beyond that. They did, it, it, and the language they, that they used is so open ended, open ended, and archetypal that you can really you can. You can plug in our modern concepts so easily. I wrote an article called Ancient Alien Astro Chickens on my website, WilliamHenry.net. And what I did is I took a look at the Edfu building text, these, these, this creation tale that was told at Edfu and housed at Edfu that talked about this elder race, this super race described as light beings in the, in the, Edfu building text, how they came from someplace else in the cosmos and created the island of the egg. And the island of the egg, of course, is thought of as Giza. And that this is the, the center place where the, the Ben Ben stone was, was ultimately discovered. This is the stone of destiny, the stone of creation, mm-hmm. which might in fact be the, the actual treasure that's, that's, that's uh, concealed within the Great Pyramid in those way upper chambers that were uh, on our way to perhaps discovering with this discovery. But mm-hmm. my point is, is that when you, when you start to read these texts, they are so advanced in their cosmology and in their concepts that we today can interpret them in light of our most advanced quantum physics, nanotechnology, and scientific discoveries. And to me, that, that's, that's quite a marvel. That is telling us that we're, we're dealing with a, a super, super advanced civilization that has left us a story, and we're, we're like E.T. following the Reese's Pieces. And this, this new discovery of this, of this chamber in the Great Pyramid, that's another major Reese's Piece that we've just uh, been given. And it, it gets me excited because it, it tells me that, hey, maybe we're, we're much closer than we think to getting the ultimate revelation, the disclosure of what is actually uh, going to be uh, unveiled at Giza. Yeah, because it's all tied together. And, and this chamber and the timing and the dating of Giza and, of course, the Sphinx and the plateau itself, everything is connected there. And when we reach outside of the box and we go to, say, Plato and, and, and Herodotus and, and their timing of their information coming out of ancient Egypt, again, that those numbers 300, 400 B.C. and so forth, that those references to Atlantis – where Plato says that he got it from somebody that, you know, but it all came out of Egypt, and there it is on the walls of Edfu, you know, the talk of this island. Now, I know it's the big A word here, and I I get that, but there's a foundation to this. This isn't made up. There is actually something to this, and there was a direct reference there, and they wanted to make sure that we in the future knew exactly what they were talking about. Right, and so if you're you're trying to leave a message for somebody ten thousand, five thousand years, ten thousand years in the future, how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to build it in stone. You're going to make it such that it's going to attract their attention, and the more they pull on it, the deeper they're going to they're going to find themselves in this mystery. And I think that's what we've what we've got here with the with the Great Pyramid is it's kind of like our ultimate decoder ring, and as we sharpen our minds on it we get closer ultimately to those who left us here. When you go uh, to Egypt, uh, just what's your, fa- what do you have a go-to place that you constantly revisit? Well, yeah, we, well, of course you, when you, when we lead tours, we're, we're always going down uh, well-trodden paths. We're, we're, we're going to Giza, we're going to Saqqara, doing the, the, the Egyptian museum and then we go down south um, to, to Upper Egypt, Nile Cruise, where we're at Karnak, Edfu, Dendera. Uh, we do the Valley of the Kings and Queens. So we, we try to, to hit all of the, the major highlights. And, and for me, every time I go, it's almost like seeing it for the first time. Right. Partly because you, it, it's just this sense of, of mythical or in mystical wonder of, of just being there to begin with. It puts you in a whole different space. And uh, it, it always charges me up. So, in fact, the, the whole experience is, is just filled with, 
with just astonishing, one astonishing wonder after another. The uh, uh, I, I keep going back to Ed Fu, and the reason why for me um, uh, the the tie in with Ed Fu and Abydos, Abydos revealing, uh, and for the audience that that may not know this, this was the original uh, uh, Valley of the Kings. Is that the right way to say it? I s- Abydos. Yeah. I, yeah, there was the, it was the gate of Osiris. It was, at Judgment Day, the, the Egyptians believed that Osiris would come back through the portal or gateway at Abydos and take the, the righteous ones uh, into the dimension of the blessed with them. So for 3,000 years before there was Jerusalem or Mecca, Abydos was the place of pilgrimage, and it, it was the place where if you had money, if you were a wealthy individual, you wanted your, your body interred so that at Judgment Day you had a good spot. And so we talk about, and this is what is, is, is so extraordinary. I'm so glad you're on the show. I never, I, I don't talk about this stuff enough. We talk so much about uh, um, ancient Sumer and Mesopotamia and the origination of languages and, and, and math, and, 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 and uh, you know, that's great. But the, the discoveries that they found in Abydos, the written languages there on all of those little, uh, uh, what do you want to call them? Little uh, stone markers, ivory. Uh, what do you, what do you, what do you, uh, anyway, that, that was predating Sumer with a written language, also a language that had sound. And we're going back to 3100 BC. That's extraordinary. Yeah, Egypt should be the English word for sound, energy, and frequency, because it, it really is all about sound and vibration. And I, I'm convinced that, that Abydos will will yet reveal even greater secrets than the Osirion, and probably, ultimately, I, I think we'll, we might even find some technology coming out of Abydos. I've, I've long since been a, a researcher of the head or pillar of Osiris that is that is enshrined at Abydos. It, right. it, we know the story that Osiris was dismembered or disassembled and that his head was, was buried at, at Abydos. When you're talking about Osiris, you have the, the story of a, of a man, a humanoid figure, uh, who is a, a great civilizer, savior figure, uh, and ultimately the god of resurrection. But you also have Osiris symbolized as a device that the physicists I've taken to Abydos can readily recognize that the, the Osiris device actually resembles a Tesla coil, and that it, it, its function, according to the ancient Egyptians, was that it was the stairway to heaven. So here we have this very technological, very advanced-looking technological device on the walls of of uh, the Temple of Seti at Abydos, suggesting that this was the place where the head of Osiris was is to be found, and that this is some form of a, a technology that was left there long ago. Now, with the Osarion, though, there's something for me that doesn't add up. Now, you've been there. I haven't. When we go, we're going to go with you and Claire, and that'll be great. Right. But it it looks to me like it's so much older i you know what i don't want to say this the wrong way but it looks like it's thousands of it looks like the background is the new construction and it is it's been built so long ago that the ground level was lower when it was built and then the sands and everything else filled in around it I don't yeah, think... that's right. It's it, the, the the Osirian is about forty feet beneath the the ground level of the current temple, and the story is is that when Seti was building his temple, Osiris came to him in a dream, told him to alter the course of his temple, and there he would discover that the tomb of Osiris, and this is why the the temple of Seti at Abydos has its very strange L shape. At least that's one story that's used to to account for it. And, of course, what's been pointed out by John Anthony West and others, that the, the construction materials, those monolithic cyclopean red granite blocks that, that composed the Osirion, match precisely the Valley Temple beside the Sphinx, which is also given the same date of about 10,000 B.C. as, as, the, as the origination or, or building date of that temple. And, you know, and why would he decide to build... Um, how do I want to say? Uh, I, I, I almost want to say underground, but this temple—if he was going to build it, 
why would he choose to build it below ground level of his own temple that he's building next door? Right, right, exactly. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't make any sense. So obviously he he discovered something from a, a previous civilization that was there, possibly even an Atlantean civilization, and that he also might even have found the original head of Osiris, uh, on the grounds there at Abydos. And again, the head of Osiris, you can put it, 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 the images of the head of Osiris, again, found it at Abydos, beside images of a Tesla coil, and they match precisely. In fact, you know what's funny about it is that uh, J.P. Morgan was Tesla's great benefactor during this time, and he was he was the one who was financing the archaeological excavations at, at Abydos. And it makes you wonder if it's possible that, that Morgan actually found something far earlier than uh, has been publicly acknowledged while uh, they're, they're digging at Abydos, and that some of, this, some of his discoveries actually made their way into the lab of Nikola Tesla. Now, when we, we all talk about the size of the, uh, you know, the blocks in the relief chamber above the king's chamber, you know, 70 tons, 50 tons, 70, you know, extraordinary weight, red granite. How did they get there? 500 miles, Aswan. Okay, it's, it's, it's fascinating to contemplate. But I think that the Asarian completely dwarfs those thoughts. Those blocks are just, ginormous isn't even a big enough word. Yeah, and it's it's truly magical. We've been very fortunate a few times. When when you go to the Osirion, you're you're always kept above ground. You're kept at the at the ground level, and you're looking down to it. And then there's this uh, set of stairs that that leads into the Osirion, and you're always just kind of sitting there like a salivating dog, wanting to go into into the Osirion. But often uh, it, it's filled with water because the the Nile rises and it. It, the, the groundwater seeps up, and they they can't even drain it. It's sort of like Oak Island; they can't <laughs> right. they can't get all that water out of there. But there are times when the Osirion is dry, and I've been fortunate to be inside the Osirion on three different occasions, and it really is a it's just a, a wondrous experience. You're you're standing in this place, and you know you're in the in the ground zero of the ultimate mysteries of, of ancient Egypt and possibly even all of humanity, that if you can answer the questions of who built this place and why, you're entering into the field or dimension of the blessed ones. You you are now connected to the consciousness of the of the divine ones. Yeah, and it has to affect you. Tell me about that. When you descend those stairs and you go down to the, the base of that with all of that granite the the electromagnetic energy that is being generated there it it has to be transforming it is and you know again you you're you're feeling tremendously privileged to be there and you're just wanting more is the thing you know that that kind of uh almost like a sense of greed sort of takes over because you want to dart through yeah you know, my wife claire the first time we went to Egypt together, and she she just goes. She heard this voice that there are these bulrushes at the end of the, at the uh, one end of the Osirian, and she heard this heard this voice that said, "Go through the bulrushes, Claire." So there she goes, and of course the Egyptian guards are are following after, and then she's led into the the actual entrance tunnel of the Osirian, which is fascinating in itself in terms of the the imagery that's contained within there it's actually a uh, a copy of the book of nine gates that talks about the soul's journey into the afterlife and so the thing is is that there's so much kind of funny business that you hear about at abydos and you can you can see why they they keep it sort of locked down for tourists they don't really want you going into um, some of these outer lying areas and in fact in our experience Abydos is one of the most protected areas in Egypt. They're, you're very closely watched when you're at Abydos by the temple guards and, and by the police. And this is something that is sort of ramped up ever since the uh, the revolution in, or the Arab Spring, rather, in 2011. When we, when we went back in 2012, and I've been in Egypt every year since the Arab Spring, and it just keeps getting better and better ever since that, that reset they went through. But when we went back to Abydos in 2012, we were with a guide, a very reliable guide, who's a real straight shooter, pretty conservative actually, who told us that during the Arab Spring, 
there were six trucks that, that went back out into the desert behind the Osirion um, armed, heavily armed. And they, came, they were out there three days. They brought uh, heavy digging equipment with them, and they came back with something quite large underneath uh, a tarp. So it made me sort of, my conspiratorial mind kind of kicked in and thought, well, golly, maybe somebody, they had to have been waiting for the Arab Spring to take place in order to, uh, to get out there into, the, into the, what's called Peg of the Gap, the area just beyond the Osirian where they believed the, that Osiris would come through the portal or gateway at Judgment Day. So what's in the fields out there? Anything goes, but I'm, I'm absolutely convinced we've only got the tip of the iceberg of, of what we're going to discover at Abydos, as well as at Giza. Don't you find it fascinating that there was no press release, there was no talk about what they found, there wasn't anything like that coming from uh, the authorities, but they, you know, armed guards and, you know, under a tarp, three days, and then you hear nothing. Exactly, exactly. So... There's always that that kind of funny business that goes on in Egypt, and it, it's been that way for all time, practically. Uh, and so, we, that's something we have to contend with. But the, 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 it gets us back to this idea of the importance of these discoveries for for all humankind. This isn't an Egyptian property, the Great Pyramid. It belongs to everybody, right. and that's something that we all have to remember that that this is our ultimate touchstone this is our ultimate stone of destiny the great pyramid and we've got to to, to take care of it and I've, I've seen too many things going on in there that you know just aren't right in terms of people abusing the privilege of being able to go into these sites um, but yet it, it, they all hold that promise that one day and who knows it could be any visitor going into the pyramid might just be the one that can that can open up the wave front, so to speak, and, and here comes this just new flood of, of knowledge and, and understanding. And it's the universe that's ultimately, I think, the timekeeper here. Now, you're going to be heading back in February. How that's safe right. is it? How safe is it? What's tourism like over there? Well, 20,000 Americans go every month now. Uh, the numbers back uh, in July, th there were 10 million visitors that have already visited Egypt this year. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the most popular years before the Arab Spring, they had 13 to 14 million visitors a year. So we're about three quarters back of, to, to where we were before the Arab Spring. And it's, in, in my experience, it's it's totally safe. We, as I said, I've been there. Claire and I have been there every year uh, since 2011, the Arab Spring, and we just keep finding it getting it. It's getting better and better. The Egyptian people are the, the, the friendliest in the world. They're the most open-hearted. They're totally welcoming to to all tourists, especially Americans. And it, it really is the, the the meeting ground of the world, or, or certainly one of them. And they it's in their best interest to to make sure that. That everything stays totally, totally safe in Egypt, and in, in fact, it is. Life goes on there, um, just like it does in Los Angeles and Chicago and Nashville. And people there want the same things that that we want. So, um, Egypt's open for business. It's time to go back to Egypt. If you've been thinking about going, now is the time to go. Now, uh, before we head to the break, just indulge me. Um, how long is is your next tour? It's 15 days. Oh, man. Okay, yep. so you guys gather in Cairo first, right? That's right. And uh, we, we spend a couple of days up in Cairo. We do uh, an overview or panoramic view of the pyramid, all ultimately aiming towards a, a private gathering between the paws of the Sphinx at the end of the tour. Hmm. And so we'll, we'll, we'll do the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. We do do our lectures, and then we go down south and uh, see Karnak. We go to the Valley of the Kings and Queens, do all the, the major temples in Luxor, and then we do our Nile cruise, which is absolutely just mouth-watering, breathtaking. I can't imagine. Uh, Edfu, too? I mean, that's just oh, on the course. way, right? Yeah, you just What do you do? Just yeah. pull the boat over? Yeah, basically, yeah. There's a dock. You get off the right. You come off your boat. There's uh, horse and uh, buggy-type carriages that, that take you... Uh, it's about a 15-minute ride from the boat to the Temple of Horus, and there you are, face-to-face -face with immortal history. 
can you tell I spend way too much time studying Egypt, man? But <laughs> but when you go, everybody, just go uh, to Google Satellite. It's fascinating to do, Google Earth, and, and, and go down the Nile and stop at Edfu, blow it up, and you can see there's a dock right there. And there's a road, and it goes uh, west out into the desert, and there it's right there. It's just sitting there, the Temple of Horus, just right there. Yeah, it's truly magical to, to, to walk up to it, like all of them. And those Ptolemaic temples are, are my favorite, too. The Edfu, Esna, uh, Dendera, right. they're just, and Philae, there's just something about them. That period of history, 300 B.C., when after Alexander the Great passes, and you've got the Ptolemaic kings building the Library of Alexandria, building the city of Alexandria, and then rebuilding these incredible Egyptian temples at the same time. That's that's I, if I could pick a time period to to return to if, as a time traveler, that would be it. Take me to Alexandria, Egypt, 300 B.C. I'd, I'd be good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre-earthquake. Right. Yeah, yeah pre-earthquake. <laughs> um, I, uh, let me see here. We got uh, two minutes. Tell me about Dendera. Um, obviously, I'm sure you take the 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 tour down below, and you guys check out the light bulb, and that's Absolutely. that's fantastic. But for me, it's the ceiling uh, of the temple above and the columns. Is that like one of the most dramatic things on this planet? Oh, it's like one of the greatest masterpieces of all time, and. When I first started going to Egypt, though, of course, the ceiling was still black. And then over the years, they started cleaning it. And now it's this most magnificent, I call it Dendera blue, the, the color that they right. are able to use there on the on the face of Hathor and all the imagery up on the ceiling, the, the gods on their arcs of the millions of years, the ship of eternity that look like modern wormholes. Yep. It's truly special. And They've done a phenomenal job of bringing that temple back to life. It's it's one of the most enchanting places you can go to because it's very green. Um, it, it's, of course, the, the Temple of Hathor. It's her temple of love and joy. And the, the vibe there is, is very feminine. It's very soft. It's very pure. and it's it's But yet it's got this phenomenal example of ancient technology that what Eric von Donneken referred to as a light bulb looks like an Ahushtent, the, the, the serpent on a pole. Right. Um, it's so much to see at Dendera. And in the back, there's this scene where you've got the, the face of, of uh, Hathor beside Cleopatra. And, and then when you find out that this whole back face of the temple was covered in gold so that when the sun rose, the face of Hathor would, would, would gleam you're just you're just blown away at the imagination and the ability of these people to 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 conceive and to construct something so magnificent. It's just totally awe inspiring. Yeah, I've spent days and days uh, looking at video of the columns there and the ceiling and the zodiac, and it's just absolutely incredible. All right, let's take a quick break right here. Our guest tonight, William Henry. When we come back, we're going to talk about his recent trip to France. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with William right after this short break. Stay with us, everybody. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black, KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carson, el tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires. This year we've experienced more than our fair share. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black. And last month I decided to make sure my family does not have to worry about food should we get caught in a real emergency situation. Introducing Numana, a healthy, storable product that tastes so good that you'll want to eat it every day instead of just during those times of duress. All new Mana products have a 25-year shelf life, are MSG and GMO-free, no preservatives, and are made in America. With the new Mana pack in your home, you'll be able to sleep at night knowing that you've protected your family. 
Not only have I tasted and tested, I own it. Now you can too. Just click on the new Mana banner on JimmyChurchRadio.com and use the promo code Jimmy when you order. In addition to a discount, we'll send you an autographed Fade to Black t-shirt. Seriously, go Beckley Tappy. Do you worry a lot whether you're a college student, busy professional, parent, or grandparent? Ongoing stress and elevated levels of the stress hormone cortisol can rob your memory, your health, and your future. Now you can combat the effects of stress and anxiety while improving your memory and recall at the same time with the dietary supplement Calm and Clever. Studies show that the ingredients in Calm and Clever reduce cortisol by as much as 30% in one to two weeks. Call 1-800-758-8746 or calmandclever.com. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) KGRARadio.com Hi, folks. CBD is the home run hitter for health right now. Why, you ask? Because of what it does for the body. Unfortunately, I can't tell you all about the benefit. You know, there's reasons. Do your due diligence and log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. Ancient Life Oil uses organic ingredients and is blended in coconut oil for some of the best benefits. Legal in 50 states and non-psychoactive. Log on to ancientlifeoil.com. That's ancientlifeoil.com. You are listening to Fate to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to black. I love these nights on the show. Nothing but Egypt. Well, we got a little France coming up. Our guest tonight, William Henry. And uh, follow us on Twitter at JChurch Radio. William, what's your Twitter? You know, I really, I, I have a, a Twitter account. I am William Henry, but I, I just never got into tweeting. Oh, it's 280 characters now, man. You can go to town. You can write a chapter to a book now. Yeah, well, I guess I'll have to dive in. I, I just... know, I know, I know. I have an Instagram account, you know, for Fade to Black. I've never been uh-huh. there. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I do the Instagram thing because I like to take a lot of photos, but but tweeting, I don't know. I just didn't never got in the habit. Yeah, yeah. Twitter is, it, it, it's unbelievable, but it, it depends on how you want to you know, approach it, but it, it, it's certainly a pretty good platform. We, we do really well with it. But anyway, uh, I am William Henry. We'll get you some followers, uh, okay, even, cool. even though you'll never know. But uh, Well, maybe you're inspiring me to, 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 to jump in. It might give me a lesson or something. Yeah, it, 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 it is really cool. Uh, we really enjoy it. I did, and bringing that up, there's a tweet that just came in. Um, who was William referencing uh, about who was doing the research on the chamber? Um, can you give that? And is that research available? Yes. Uh, the gentleman's name, and he's actually my, my webmaster. His name is Mark Foster. And he wrote an article uh, for Heretic. He's the editor, along with Andrew Goff, of Heretic Magazine. And you can find... If you Google um, Mark Foster uh, Heretic Magazine, um, it, it will take you right to uh, to his article about the Great Pyramid, where he uh, they've they've. Uh, in fact, I'm on the website right now. Yeah, I'm there too. Um, He's been writing with Ralph Ellis too, as well. Yes, yeah. Mark wrote to to Ralph Ellis early on when he started putting together this research on the trial passages. And um, 
Ralph picked it up immediately and um, helped Mark to kind of publicize his idea. Mark is one of these kind of behind the scenes sort of researcher, editor types that uh, has been in the game a long, long time, knows everybody. He's in London and uh, is a phenomenal webmaster as well. But he's a, a real deep thinker in this regard and keeps his, a lot of his findings quiet. Um, but because he wants to be sure and certain, and this is one of them. So I highly recommend uh, his article. It's called The Trial Passages of a Message in Stone. Yeah, I've got it right here. I can't wait to uh, for this show to end. <laughs> I love discovering, man. I, 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 I just do. And, and, and the, the combination uh, with Ralph Ellis, I mean, Ralph, I just, he's a frequent guest here on the show, but another guy that, uh, takes a look at things from outside of the box. Yeah, totally. I've I've enjoyed Ralph's work over the years as well. Very, very interesting. Hi. Right, so you, you and you and Claire just went to France, and I begged uh, of you not to tell me a thing. Where did you guys go? Well, we did our usual uh, run to Rennes le Chateau, mm. but this tour was a bit different. We called it the Healing Road from Languedoc to Lourdes. Our, our main objective was to look at this whole southern France area from the perspective that all of these apparitions of the Virgin Mary that are reported throughout the Pyrenees, and they've been going on for hundreds of years, and right. had numerous occurrences of this appearance of what they call the White Lady. Um, as I was started to look a little more deeply into this story, I realized that these, these appearances of, of the Virgin Mary perfectly align with what, what I've been researching in terms of light being researched from ancient Samaria, from the Egyptian perspective, the, the Essene perspective, and this idea started to kind of formulate that, okay, Mary, as the first Christian to ascend, had attained her light body, similar to what Jesus attained in, in his resurrection, and that meant that she had all these these capabilities that align her with the, the light beings that you read about, in, as I said, in Egypt and Samaria. So I went there looking for the, the places that, that uh, these apparitions had taken place. And in particular, the, most, the, the strongest and most powerful are at Lourdes. And Lourdes, of course, is a, is a well-known Catholic healing center where millions of people go every year because of the the waters that were that are believed to have a healing quality that were that emerged from a spring that were opened up by an apparition of Mary to a young girl from Lourdes and it was I got to tell you Jimmy I have it, it was like entering Lourdes was like walking through a curtain into another world a, a world of in, just incredible reverence incredible faith and the highest vibration, spiritual vibration, I have felt anywhere on the planet. Did you drink the water? Absolutely. Drank the water, took the bath, did the procession with about 5,000 people at night. Starting at 9 o'clock, there's a, a procession, a gathering. And on the night we were there, there were, there were 5,000 people that were there that led this procession, um, that were in a procession that was led by, must have been 500, 750 people in wheelchairs that have all come there to, to Lourdes for, in many cases, it's their last stop. They're looking for that, that healing miracle to take place. And it was the singular spiritual experience, most human experience I've ever had in my life with being amongst these people. Now, is it wasn't there? Help me on this, and if I'm wrong, just correct me. But wasn't there like a Lord's uh, Lord's chalice that they would drink the water out of? That that had something to do going I back. Don't know about the chalice? No, I mean the basic story is that um, what ended up being the Virgin Mary appeared over 17 times to a young girl named Bernadette. She didn't know who it was. She's just a 14-year-old girl, basically illiterate, half-starving. And she kept seeing this glowing being that she called that thing, kept appearing to her and told her, asked her to open up a spring, to uh, build a chapel there and invite the world to come to this place. And so I've never seen a reference to a specific chalice, but there's definitely a spring there that uh, where this water emerges that uh, actually opened up into a you know, kind of a gusher 
um, with the help of uh, the apparition of the Virgin Mary. And now, as I say, millions of people come to Lourdes every year to to experience this vibration. And what attracted me to it was I, I'm, uh, th- this glowing being, this light being. Mary is this is this light being that can phase from the the celestial realms into the earth plane and can engender uh, or infuse a whole area with this frequency or vibration that can produce miracles. Right. But at the same time, I started to, to realize that based on the, the correspondence with the, with the Tibetan tradition, and in the Tibetan tradition, they tell us that these light beings can infuse whole valleys or areas with the, the frequency of the light body. And that's what I was under the uh, kind of the assumption or uh, – following the trail of is that Mary has, in addition to opening this healing spring at Lourdes, she also infused the whole area with the frequency of, of the light body. And by tapping into that, we're able then to begin to activate our own light bodies. I'm looking at these pictures of the sanctuary, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it looks like there are thousands of people there. There are. Yeah, that it's, there's, uh, on the on the few days that we were there, and we, we, this was in the first part of October, so the the crowds were away. That it, it, it's definitely not the high season. There was there was probably ten fifteen thousand people that were at Lourdes during that time. That's in, it, it's incredible. So did you uh, see it at night when it was lit up? Oh yeah, uh, I mean day and night, and the, and the nighttime experience to me again. This procession was just absolutely the most beautiful and 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 special spiritual experience i've i've ever ever experienced yeah um when you you five thousand people in a procession all singing ave maria and you don't have to be catholic to to feel the uh, an incredible presence there there's something more there that you're not going to find anywhere else on earth and to to walk in this procession and, and be part of that was just Mind blowing, and as I told our group, for for us, we're coming there pretty sound in mind, body, and spirit. None of us were there on a on a pilgrimage to heal a a, 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 a disease or or something of that nature. We were there as and not as tourists, but as spiritual tourists. We're there to to experience the place, but primarily what we were there for is to to support those who were, who who have come there as their last stop, as their hospice, and to to support their their quest for for wholeness. So uh, let's uh, let's move uh, to. I'm posting a picture right now of the chapel and the procession in front of it. It's pretty mm-hmm. dramatic. I mean, it's about as beautiful of uh, of a building as you're ever going to see uh, for sure. How old is it, by the way? Well, the 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 whole story actually begins in 1858 at Lourdes. That's when. Bernadette began to have these uh, experiences with the Lady in White, this this glowing light being that she later learned was the Virgin Mary. So everything is built in the, in the period after that. So that the the Basilica probably dates to in the, about the 1870s, 1880s. Yeah, it's pretty beautiful. Uh, it's spectacular. R- R- Rene Le Chateau. Oh man, uh, it's it's hard. Um, I got into Rennie uh, before uh, the Da Vinci Code, right? I stumbled mm-hmm. upon, yeah, yeah, I stumbled upon it in the mid '90s, and and uh, and did my thing with it, and then you know, Da Vinci Code came out later, and it 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 blew up. But when did you first visit uh, Rennie Le Chateau? It was 1996. So four years before the madness. Yes. Well, actually, 10 years before the madness. Right. 10 years before the madness. When I went up there the first time, you could have bought the whole mountaintop, the Baron J. Saunier's uh, Tour Magdala, his Villa Batania, the house that he built. You could have bought all that for about $100,000. The the driveway going to the bottom of the hill thrown in. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and... It, which meant it was a pretty sleepy village. Or maybe fifty thousand people or so would would hike up that hill every year. Most of them French tourists. A lot of them coming there because of Holy Blood, Holy Grail, right? Um, treasure seekers looking for the the ultimate treasure of Baron J. Saunier and and Ren Le Chateau. And then it, what was it? Two thousand six. 
that uh, Da Vinci Code blew up and all of a sudden Rennes le Chateau turned into Disneyland and there was 100, over 100,000 people, maybe 200,000 people a year that were coming there through from 2006 through 2010 or 11 or so, just completely out of control. Oh. And now, 2017, 10 years after that, what a hit job uh, has been done on that place. It just seems like whatever mystery was ever hidden there is now even better concealed after Dan Brown did his number on it. Because How so? Most well, most people now think, though, the whole mystery is all made up by Dan Brown. It's all fictional. And, and the whole place has just been rendered kind of, uh, it's like just dis, dis, disarmed in a way, in my opinion. I mean, when I first went there, to me personally, in my own experience, the, the mystery of the place was palpable. I mean, you, could, you felt like any moment now you were going to turn over a stone and and something was going to, uh, an aspect of the mystery was going to be revealed. Now you go there and it's just all touristy. It's all covered up. And in fact, um, you know, it, it was really kind of tragic because one of the, the sort of fun or mysterious aspects of uh, the, the Church of Mary Magdalene at Rennes Chateau was this demon guardian that you find at the entrance way. Right. I was disheartened to, to see that, um, uh, one of the locals had come in with a baseball bat and basically destroyed the demon guardian and then took the same bat to the to Baron J. Saunier's painting of Mary Magdalene uh, beneath the altar. So people are still really upset about the mysteries of Renle Chateau and the heresy that's inferred there. And, you know, basically now, I hate to say it, but it's been kind of been turned into a sort of a tourist trap. The are you talking about the 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 demon that was in the green robe? Yes, has been destroyed. Yep. Yeah, someone took a baseball bat to his head and just bashed his head in. Oh no! Yeah, really terrible. Uh, and and so it's uh, okay. Wait a minute. How many people? You, you, how many people are visiting today? Um, I, you know, I don't know the exact number, Jimmy, but. Um, there, there's, there's probably must be around 30,000 or so people a year going there. And what, what th- this is the thing, and I'm going to post a, a couple of pictures up. I just found a shot of the demon. So I'm going to go, you know, post this up to show everybody how tragic it is that somebody would do something like this. Um, but back in the, in the day when you were there in, in the nineties, uh, the discovery and and searching of clues and and going through this and the prior of Scion and and gravestone all of that stuff was still there and the sense of wonder was there. But we, are you saying it's almost been gentrified? I mean, yes. what, what's the difference? Yeah. Uh, it's just it feels like it's just been neutered that um, the 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 tourist aspect of it has taken over. The story's being whitewashed, and you certainly don't have access like you used to have access. You could, you could walk through the Villa Britannia, his home, and and and, and actually stay there when I when I first started going there because I, I actually did stay there on a couple of occasions, and you, you just felt like the mystery was still alive. And now after Dan Brown, not so much. It's not so much as alive as it used to be. It's just kind of a. A tourist thing now. Now, what about, uh, okay, throughout the valley there and into the hillsides and some of the clues uh, that possibly this treasure or whatever it may be, we can just mm-hmm. call it treasure, uh, may still be hidden away in, in, a, in a cave and still undiscovered. Absolutely. I mean, there's no question in my mind, in, in my opinion, I I think that uh, that when you're in the area of Renle Chateau, you're in the Pyrenees, you're in this region where there's all these myths and legends about these glowing light beings. You have the Cathars that are there that are talking about ascension and transitioning through portals and gateways into the divine realm. And so the, the entire area around Renle Chateau is literally saturated in these, in these mysteries. And you're you're in a spectacularly beautiful part of the world. You're, you're you're in the foothills of the Pyrenees. It's very pure, very rugged area. It's sort of like Colorado. And what partly what attracts me to the area is just the the pure water, the fresh air, and the uh, you know just the, the the light of the sky. It's that 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 is really to me part of the the real treasure of Renle Chateau. But what keeps 
me coming back to this area is you know just the allure that maybe this really is the the place where the story and the grapes of the the grapes of the promised land took place and let me explain that there's a Nicholas Poussin is, was a, a famous painter that's all tied up with the Renle Chateau mystery. He had a, a famous painting called Shepherds of Arcadia. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Wren researchers locked onto that and said, oh, yeah, what, what Poussin, Poussin was supposed to have known a secret that made him more powerful than any king, and that his paintings encode this secret. And one of the takes is that his painting, The Shepherds of Arcadia, which shows the shepherds gathered around a tomb, is in fact that it points to the actual burial place of Jesus, that somehow after the crucifixion, he, he survived the crucifixion and brought these secrets to Renle Chateau and maybe even lived out his days there, and that the tomb of Jesus will actually be found there. Um, Poussin had another painting, though, called Grapes of the Promised Land, and this is the one that, that really intrigues me. The subject matter is these two thieves that, that Moses had dispatched after escaping uh, Egypt, coming, coming through the Red Sea. Moses and the Israelites are headed for the Promised Land. And Yahweh directs Moses to send out two spies from each of the 12 tribes. And a couple of these spies go to this place called Eshkol, which means Valley of the Cluster, as in grapes. And they get there and their names are Joshua and Caleb, by the way. And so Joshua and Caleb get to the Valley of the Cluster, as in grapes, and they see that the giants live there, the sons of Anak live there, and that the land consumes the people. And when, when they arrive there, they steal this oversized cluster of grapes from the Anunnaki, from the giants. And they bring them back to Moses, and they tell Moses, we're not going anywhere near uh, the, 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 these vineyards because the Anunnaki live there, and the land consumes the people. Now, your Bible commentators say, oh, what this means is that uh, the land didn't provide enough food for the people, which is belied by the fact that this, these vineyards are in the promised land, the land of milk and honey. So obviously it must have provided enough food for the people. Right. So there's another, there's another explanation here. This is, there's a mystery here. And the way I looked at it is that when Joshua and Caleb are seeing people walk along the surface of the earth and they suddenly vanish, the land appears to consume the people. But these people knew about portals. They knew about burning bushes where divine beings could manifest. They, they knew about uh, d d gateways and portals into other realms. And this is what I think they experienced among the Anunnaki was a portal or a gateway. And they stole evidence of their ability to traverse this gateway. They went to some otherworldly realm where the grapes are so huge and heavy that it takes two people to carry them. And so they bring these grapes back to Moses, and you'd think the, the book of Numbers, which tells this story, would have made a big deal out of it. Hey, humans stole something from the Anunnaki, you know, and let's make a big deal out of this. Aren't we great? Right. Instead, they, they drop the story cold. And you, you, you think they might have said, oh, well, Moses took him and put him in the Ark of the Covenant with the blue sapphire stones that he brought from his first trip up Mount Sinai or, or something like that. Right. But they don't. They drop the story. It's only in these in the mystery tradition, especially in southern France, and I've also found it in Sion, Switzerland, where you see depictions of Joshua and Caleb with this, this, this cluster of grapes, and they brought them to the crucifixion. Now, I want the audience to understand what we're talking about here, the way that Poussin has depicted it, and the way that it is described. Um, you have to picture in your mind two full-grown men with mm -hmm. uh, with uh, a log in between them on their shoulders, right, four yeah. inches in diameter. The cluster of grapes isn't what you buy at Whole Foods. No. The, the cluster of grapes is three feet around and three feet, four feet tall, and the grapes are the size of softballs. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so that's what we're talking. We're not talking. When you say cluster of grapes, William, and you know what you're referencing, I do. But the yeah. audience, no, we're not talking about something you're holding in your hand. No. It, it is being transported uh, between two full-grown men, and the, the grapes are bigger than they are. The exactly. cluster, so yes. Th so the message here is they, they seem to be otherworldly. There's something very mystical about them. And they, they, the next place that they turn up, these two thieves turn up with these grapes 
at the base of the, the cross of the crucifixion, and Jesus is all lit up in light. And so I look at that and go, okay, so the two thieves that were crucified on either side of Jesus, what they're saying is it's Joshua and Caleb. And the grapes that they brought to the crucifixion are the portal secrets of the Anunnaki. And so when you start to look at, at these mysteries and you connect the, the crucifixion of Jesus and his resurrection into light with the, the stories of the Anunnaki as, as light beings, it, it starts to paint this picture that, okay, what was stolen by Joshua and Caleb and symbolized by these clusters of grapes is some kind of secret relative to the transmutation of the human body and the opening of portals. And that is the ultimate mystery that we find in southern France, where over and over again, we're, we're hearing stories about a point of light in the sky. Right. We're hearing these stories about illuminated beings, light beings, apparitions of the Virgin Mary are all over the place in this region of France. And that, that to me, is the, is the real allure of this place, that perhaps, as these legends tell us, there are the, this, this order or race of beings that live outside of time that still live in this area. And perhaps the portals or gateways of the Anunnaki, the vineyards that they're talking about in the Valley of Eshkol, were actually in southern France, in the vineyards of southern France around Rennes Chateau. What is it with Poussin? What, what, what is it with this guy? <laughs> Every painting of his, you, you look at it and you go, okay, all right, I got to pick this apart. There's way too much geometry going on here. There's, there's a message. You have to look at the background. You have to look at the scene and, and take it in, in his totality because he's got a message here. It's just not great painting. What, you know, what is it? What was he trying to tell us? He well, had knowledge again, I mean, too. He was reputed to have known a secret that made him more powerful than even the king of France. And it's some kind of a mystical secret. Some people believe it has to do with bloodlines or genealogies. Personally, I think Poussin is one of these that, that, that ultimately knew the, the secret of our, of our transmutation into light and the secret of connecting with other dimensional worlds. And I'll tell you something else that's not too far uh, from Rene and the Pyrenees. Well, it's right there. It's the Lascaux Caves. That's right. Yeah. Terrasson and is that whole area that the human habitation or, or habitation is said to go back 450,000 years in this area. You've got dinosaur museums right next to the vineyards. And you, <laughs> you are in an extremely ancient, ancient place. And it, it's very pure as well. And that's, uh, again, what, what attracts me to it is just this opportunity to be out in nature. You're hiking, you're climbing, you're, you're going up some of these, uh, like Mont Segur, the last refuge of the Cathars. You're, you're, you're taking a hike up a mountain 3,600 feet that is, uh, it offers this just spectacular view. And you can, you can really feel the, the presence of something cosmic in these places. And this, again, goes to the stories of the Cathars building their, their refuges on these mountaintops, these castles, as literally as, as star chambers, star chambers and transformation chambers. They they knew something about our the human ability to touch the divine and our ability to be transformed by that divine light. And that that light is in the soil of this area. It's in the trees. It's in the rivers. It's in the mountains. It's in the grapes. We're going to continue this conversation in just a couple of minutes. Our guest tonight. William Henry. William, I'm not done with Southern France. We're going to continue. When we come back, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Our guest tonight, William Henry. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. It's Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. This is KGRA Digital Broadcasting Station, Salt Lake City, Utah, Van Buren, Arkansas. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER, stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 
60 years of research has gone into chelation, and angioprim is the result. A safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation. Paging Dr. Jones, please report to the emergency room right away. Log on now for a special radio offer from angioprim. That's angioprim.com slash radio. A-N-G-I-O-P-R-I-M. Angioprim.com slash radio or call 877-882-7221. That's 877-882-7221. So you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on 24-7 with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com Hello, Fader Knots. This is Jimmy Church, and I'm introducing New Pharma, a company whose products are based on science. Human function based on the endocannabinoid system, or ECS. New Pharma firmly believes in this science, and their research indicates that support of the ECS provides the beneficial effects for a healthy lifestyle. New Pharma's science includes relief capsules for pain relief, sleep capsules, which are natural support for occasional sleeplessness, foundation is support for your ECS, and fit capsules support your active lifestyle. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2B for a 33% discount on all of their products. Or visit newpharma.com for all of the knowledge on the science. That's G-N-U-Pharma.com. Go back, Lee Tappy. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, our guest tonight, one of my favorite guests, William Henry is here. Nothing but great conversation. Follow us on Twitter at JChurchRadio. That's simple. You can follow William at I am William Henry. You know, to separate you, uh, William, from all the other William Henrys out there, you know, the <laughs> imposters. Um, this is this is what's trippy. And and the whole discussion about Dan Brown uh with this, um this is it's it's still rooted. He did great research. You know, he based things on uh, reality. Well, holy blood, holy grail. Let's <laughs> let's not kid ourselves. But uh, Mary Magdalene, Sarah, and and what was coming out of Jerusalem through the Mediterranean and and landing in France, um, and and moving um, uh, moving moving north and 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 planting their roots there. That's where all of this comes from. It's it's not like. It's a uh, fiction that Dan Brown made up. No, it's not. He was drawing upon centuries of French belief that the Holy Family came and lived in this area, and that, in fact, descendants of the Holy Flam- Family lived there, that the Cathars were reincarnations of the Essenes, that they were doing the same things as the Essenes in terms of 
working towards their ascension or transfiguration, their transformation into angelic beings. And this is what uh, targeted the, the, this is the reason why Rome targeted the Essenes for extermination in 70 AD and why the, the Catholic Church targeted the Cathars for extermination in beginning in uh, the, the 1240s, is that they wanted the elimination of these mystical secrets of these celestial beings. They just wanted this eliminated. I mean, you talk about people that were pushing for disclosure and for the existence of otherworldly or extraterrestrial beings, the, the Cathars were, were right up there. And they, they, again, claimed that they were descendants of or reincarnations of the people that were hanging out with Jesus and Mary Magdalene. Uh, where uh, where did you uh, head to first when you were in this part of France and in, in, in the southeast um, uh, on this trail of Mary? Uh, have you gone through there and and checked it out? The local, the local lore, the local churches. Uh, you know, there's evidence of it everywhere, isn't isn't there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's just kind of common common knowledge and, and and commonly understood in this area that that they revere the Magdalene you'll you'll see many churches of Mary Magdalene in this area not just at at Rennes Chateau and you you generally see this reverence for overall the the white lady this concept of a of a recurring symbol of a of a divine feminine figure who's a glowing uh, a glowing humanoid being feminine being be it considered to be Mary or Dom Blanche or or even uh, sometimes it's, she's equated with Mary Magdalene. There are these stories over and over again of these lights seeing up on a mountain. And when people get up there, they see this glowing white lady who is a, an illuminated, uh, a celestial being, a heavenly being that brings a, a healing vibration or a healing teaching or something of that nature. That's the, the kind of the basic basic lore of the or, or mysticism of this area centers on on this being now what about uh what about the possibility of these areas uh being a vortex or a ley line uh i don't want to quite go stargate yet but certainly these were special places for for these uh kings they were they were originally and the, the part of the tie in here is that these were considered to be vaults or repositories, because what you find here is that this whole area is just riddled with caves. For example, uh, near Rennes Chateau, you have a famous uh, magic mountain, if you will, called Bougarach. It, That's right. Uh, it, it's considered the umphalos or center mountain of this whole area, and it's got caves radiating out that go through Rennes Chateau. They go out into uh, outer lying areas as well. And in fact, the, the locals will tell you the story that when Steven Spielberg was doing his Close Encounters of the of the Third Kind movie, that he came to Bukharach. That that was the actual mountain that was later portrayed as Devil's Mountain in the movie, and the reason why he had the the Frenchman in Close Encounters was because he was paying, uh, he's he was tipping off that this is originally a, a mystery or a story that's set in France. And of course, in Spielberg's vision, he's got this giant mothership that lands at this mystical mountain. But in the in the in the local version of the story of Bugarach, there are definitely ships, but it's actually the mountain itself that opens up, and you have these illuminated illuminated beings that are inhabiting this mountain and taking humans into the mountain and into the celestial realms. Now, I've heard I've heard about the illuminated beings, but I haven't heard the references to ships in the sky. And you're saying that this is like this is this is mythology. This is local lore. This is not just local lore. This is local actual belief. And in fact, in 2012, there was they made a big deal about Bugarac being the the actual ground zero for whatever was going to happen in 2012. And in December 21st, 2012, the World Press gathered at Bugarac because they they really believed that something incredible was going to happen there. And so, what they tell us is that Bugarac is there's a it's a no fly zone for for aircraft. Although sometimes you will see military craft there. And there's many, many references to UFO sightings, to craft being sighted uh, in uh, over Bugarac and around Bugarac. Now, have you seen anything there? Have you seen anybody illuminated? No, I haven't. I actually haven't. Uh, my wife Claire has, 
but I haven't. She's much more of a seer than I am. So maybe you can talk about that with Claire sometime. Yeah, I will. I will. Now, didn't you tell me, didn't you, didn't you spend the night in Rene Le Chateau and have something happen? Yeah, I did. I had a ghost sighting at that's Le Chateau. right. I, that's right. kind of, freak. I thought it was like a demon with these bright blue <laughs> eyes that was just standing over me as I, as I woke up. Do you know, I had, day. I had nightmares for like three days after you told me that story. <laughs> I mean that's crazy. Uh, um, oh, go ahead. Since we're on, Rene, we're talking about the south of France. What happened that night? Well, I was staying at the Villa Britannia uh, in one of the bedrooms there upstairs. And Villa Britannia is the home that was built by Baron J. Sonia once he acquired his tremendous wealth. By, by however means he acquired that wealth, he he builds this this beautiful villa that's named after Bethany, where Mary Magdalene was supposed to have lived. It's all dedicated to, to Mary Magdalene. I'm in this upstairs room, and suddenly I'm awakened by these two beaming blue eyes uh, that are just above me, and I can sort of distinguish a sort of humanoid-type figure. I mean, the first thing that I thought of was this the, the bright blue-eyed devil or demon that is the guardian of the, of the church of Mary Magdalene. We talked about a moment ago, when you, when you enter into it, there's this green-robed demon with these bright blue eyes. And I, I honestly thought that's who that was. And of course, we know that, that that demon's name is Asmodeus. He's the guardian of the treasure of Solomon's temple. And that's why he's placed there at the entranceway to the church of Mary Magdalene, because the belief is that the, that church somehow conceals, among other things, the, the location of the, the of uh, the of Solomon's temple, the, the treasure of Solomon's temple that was taken from Jerusalem to Rome and then ultimately made its way into the Renle Chateau area uh, via the Visigoths. When you first opened your eyes, what did you see? These just these two piercing blue eyes drilling holes through me. How and and how big was this apparition? I would I would have put it at somewhere around like seven feet tall. That's crazy. Yeah, and any any noise, any smell, any and anything that I can recall. No, uh, uh-uh. solid. No, not that I can recall. Did you see through it? It was like totally like a a black, completely black figure, except for the eyes. But I could detect that it was sort of humanoid in shape. Now, what did you do, <laughs> William? What did you do in the morning? Who did you tell? I I was I had a traveling companion, a professor that I was traveling with, and I told her about it, and she's you know, was like, "Here we go, welcome to Renle Chateau." Yeah, right. And did has there been other uh, reports of this happening? Not uh, that I know of. That's a that's a good question. I haven't ever really pursued it to see if anybody else has had that that encounter. Because I haven't heard anything like this, so it's feeling a little personal. Yeah, and you know, I typically don't consider myself an experiencer, although from time to time, things like that will happen. And uh, that was definitely quite memorable. Yeah, I'm looking at uh, Bukharach right here, and you're absolutely right. That that could have been that could have been close encounters. And I don't I don't know why he didn't use this. It's just as cool, if not cooler than the Devil's Tower. Yeah. And they say that uh, Captain Bukharach of uh, Jules Verne's journey to the center of the earth is a reference to Bukharaj as being a, a portal or gateway into the inner earth. So there's that whole aspect of, of the legend and lore of this area that's that's very alluring, very intriguing, that in fact, that what we see on the surface is just the gateway into the, the underground realm there, the inner earth. Now, I want to go back uh, really quick uh, to Giza. There's a question here on Twitter uh, from Do Sky. And Abydos and Giza are big parts of the Stargate story. Jimmy, please ask William if he thinks Roland Emmerich and Dean uh, Devlin were revealing insights regarding the machine head of Osiris. I, you know, I wondered that. Uh, I've actually talked with a screenwriter who worked with Dean Devlin and asked him about that. And Dean Devlin, he said, just really didn't display any. Uh, overt knowledge of any of these esoteric mysteries that he was just kind of maybe channeling or or pulling a great story. And personally, I I find that hard to believe because 
Stargate was such a perfect interpretation of Zachariah Sitchin's books that that he had to have read Sitchin in order for, to produce the, that film. And then you've got the Stargate references to, to Abydos. They're obviously either just you know doing sketchy research and pulling names, or deep within it, there's 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 somebody that really knows what's going on that does, that isn't getting any credit for those stories. Yeah, I really enjoy Stargate, and every time that I watch it, um, I, you know what? I go back to the first time that I watched. I thought, you know, yeah, great great sci fi movie. And you watch it over and over again, and that's where I get into the dangerous zone when it comes to Hollywood. I don't like making references to Hollywood movies based on my beliefs or my research. Like I, you know, it is it, it is uh, uh, what's contaminating me and my thoughts, right? Based on something going, coming out of Hollywood. The more that I watch Stargate. It is so spot on the money, not only with history and its research, but everything that I know about Egypt, it it is spot on the money. Does it have the same effect on you? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, having worked for Robert Downey Jr. and been involved in that, I can see how there's there's an invisible hand. Like I was, he, he, he consulted me when he was doing Iron Man, but I'm not credited but he, he, when he sent me the script, he said, "I want you to find three to five points in this in the script where you, the character can be. Uh, I want him to be more like you," is what he said, because um, he didn't like that the, the, there would be this overt message in Iron Man of that the only way for kids to a, a, attain any sense of real personal power would be to put on one of these nano suits. And the, as he explained it to me, the script was a contract and he couldn't change any of the words, but he was looking for some subtle nuances that would kind of tweak the character a little bit or maybe add something that would kind of maybe soften the message or somehow uh, uh, take Iron Man into a, a, another level that might tweak the imagination. So I know that in a lot of these movies, there's got to be some unseen hands there that are, are maybe not credited, that you're never hearing about, that are actually feeding some of these storylines. And Stargate totally has that flavor for me. And there's a, a, one of the funniest parts of the movie, and uh, I, I want your comment on this. In the very beginning, when uh, uh, James uh, Spader is uh, giving his spe- uh, you know, his presentation at the uh, museum, yeah. And somebody raises their hand and asks the classic question, well, if the Egyptians didn't build the pyramids, who did, right? That's the question. <laughs> and, and Spader responds, well, uh, you know, uh, I don't know. Everybody gets up and leaves. Right. Right? What a message in the movie. I think, yeah, you know, totally. it, that gets lost on people, but that's exactly, it was just spot on. Uh, Dean Devlin is doing his research because that that was uh, um, uh, as as accurate as it as it can be, at least for us in our community. I agree, and I used to get it all the time that I'm the, I was the real life Daniel Jackson, you know, his character, because I would tweak words and like he did and play with words, and I, I love that. But you know, the thing I didn't like about Stargate, and I also didn't like about Contact, which were both really revolutionary movies when they came out, that were. Giving giving some real clues about the existence of Agent Stargates is that in in Stargate they had Kurt Russell playing this Air Force dude who brings a nuclear missile through through the Stargate and you know, just based on what I always was reading about the ancient portals and gateways that was that was just just simply not going to happen because first of all. Flesh and blood can't go through these portals or gateways. And two, I, I definitely believe, based on the, my research into the ancient stories anyway, that there are benevolent beings out there, highly benevolent beings, that will not let us take our nuclear mes- missiles and weaponize space. That's my personal belief. I know there's a lot of people that talk are talking these days about secret space programs and, and weaponization of, of, uh, of space and wars in space with extraterrestrials, but... Everything that I've seen about it is kind of leaning me in the direction that by the time we're evolved enough to open a, a Stargate like that, we're not going to be thinking about taking nuclear weapons into space with us. What were the uh, – we've talked about Stargates a lot, but I've never asked you this. What were they used for? Transportation systems. I mean, anytime you would see, for example, the Anunnaki coming and going in, in Sumerian art, 
they're they're stepping through gateways. They're wearing glowing robes of light, and this is ultimately their their meth- method of transportation. They're phasing in between dimensions or or dematerializing what Star Trek calls beaming. That's that's how they would be transported through the through the cosmos. Do you think that there's a chance uh, that we have found one? I think there's a chance that we have found uh, not just stories, but also images of of their technology, and that if we follow their teachings, we could we could eventually find one. Um, you know, we talked about Saddam and in his interest in these stargates and the possibility that our our invasion of Iraq was all about acquiring or locking down these stargates. So. Yeah, I I think that's it's quite possible that there are literal physical gateways that we can get a handle on. But what you really need is the the spiritual teachings of the software to make it go to transform the human, preparatory to engaging with those stargates. I got another question here in Twitter. Um, this is this is from Osiris Machine. That's the Twitter handle. <laughs> Um, great. Yeah, great. What about uh, the scorch marks in the ceiling, uh, uh, referring to Dendera? Piezoelectric active resonations, maybe granite as the conductive pathway? Yeah, there's certainly that, that perspective that that granite is holding the, the, the vibration that can open up the gateway and that maybe there was some kind of chemical reaction even involved. Um, I don't know. That's a little out of my uh, my wheelhouse. And Chris Dunn would be a better one to ask about that. Yeah, yeah. I wish he was healthier. I would have him on the show for sure. Um, yeah, wishing him all the best. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and Jaws, too, as well. Jaws, if you're absolutely. listening. Man, uh, you know. Um, is uh, Is this. When we look at the probably infinite uh, theories on why the Great Pyramid is even there, whether it is a grain silo or it's a tomb or it's a weapon or it's a marker or it's a stargate or, 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 or. What's your what's your best guess these days? <laughs> I still go with Transfiguration Machine. I, I really believe that the, the, the Great Pyramid is a, is a stargate type of device that can... Uh, de- help dematerialize a human into light and then beam us through the cosmos. So if we go back and we look at the uh, the Book of the Dead and it being uh, uh, not, a, not a tomb, but a way to, for whoever, and, and it may be a pharaoh, to, to go to the other side, Mm-hmm. Is, that, is that what you're suggesting? That, that that's... Yes, that where the pyramid texts describe the Pharaoh transforming into light or yes. lightning-like being, a plasma being. And do you remember um, uh, Dr. Fibes? No. Uh, Dr. Fibes, man. Uh, Vincent Price. Huh. The movie, Dr. Fibes and Dr. Fibes Returns. No, never saw it. Okay. Well, anyway, 1969, 1970, 1971 B-movies about exactly this and it, it's b-movies okay but it's it's vince price dr fibes uh going and then he ends up reconstructing but anyway uh doing just that and and it was it was really weird how hollywood in a b-movie would present so accurately this this theory on what the pyramids were for and how they would uh uh transport and and actually in the movie check this out this is what they did <laughs> this is um they had a uh, a river uh a canal inside of the pyramid about four feet wide mm-hmm. water running um uh electrified sacred water and you would get into this little boat like a canoe and then you would, you know, float uh, into this entrance like a cave, and that that was it. And you were immortal. After wow, that. that's so cool. I mean, yeah, check yeah. That oh, out. They're already posting it right here on Twitter. You guys are too good. You guys are too <laughs> quick. All right. So what's up next for you? Uh, the uh, the I'm assuming February going to 
uh, Egypt, and then right after that, you're going to be right back here at the Conscious Life Expo, right? Or is it Conscious Life first, then Egypt? Conscious Life first, then Egypt, and uh, so that'll be February 26th to March 12th, and then we'll be back in France uh, doing our Languedoc to Lourdes tour at the end of May, May 20, uh, 25th through June 5th. How um, is there space available for either of those trips? We got a few spaces left for Egypt, and yes, the France tour we're booking now. So uh, people, if they're interested, they can go to my website williamhenry.net, click on tours, and I'll, I'll send you out a one of our uh, legendary tour brochures. They're like sixty pages long, with filled with beautiful color photos, and they're, they're just wonderful little booklets in themselves. And what are you going to be speaking about at uh, the Conscious Life Expo? I am I'm on the the trans transhumanism and uh, AI path and trying to do what I can to help everybody realize the the consequences of what we're doing um, with linking ourselves with AI and the spiritual implications the the soul implications of of, of doing that and um, so be be talking about that in my workshop the presentation actually is called summoning the demon calling all angels the the ai conspiracy in the way of the future and then i'll be doing a post-conference workshop called the sacred art of ascension where i'll be talking about sovereignty mastery freedom and how we can uh, tap into our what i call ascension intelligence through sacred art I really look forward to it, and I can't wait to uh, hang out with you and Claire when you guys come back to Los Angeles. Thank you so Likewise. much, William. Thank you, Jimmy. Behave and have a great rest of your evening. Okay, thank you, sir. You too, and thank you, everybody, once again for listening. Wonderful Th- time. Thank you, William. Okay. William Henry. Now, WilliamHenry.net, all of the info for the next Egypt tour is right there, and that Lord's trip sounds absolutely amazing, too, as well. And he will be out here at the beginning of February for the Conscious Life Expo. And what's really cool about that is on Friday night, the Conscious Life Expo uh, opening night in the Plaza Ballroom, I will be hosting the Ancient Aliens panel. William is going to be on that panel. Um, Also, and uh, tickets and everything else are at ConsciousLifeExpo.com. Check this panel out. It's William Henry. It is uh, Corey Good, uh, David Wilcock, uh, Jay Widener, and Linda Moulton Howe, all on the same panel. And also that night, and that's why I want all of you Fader Knots there, we're going to be, uh, uh, I'm going to do a tribute to uh, Jim Mars. And that will be Friday night, opening night at Conscious Life Expo. So you got to come out and check out all of that. All right, I'm going to take a quick break. I will open up the phone lines, and we'll uh, do that. We'll go open lines now, and I'll be right back. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Thank you, William Henry. Absolutely wonderful, perfect conversation and perfect night here on Fade to Black. I'll be right back. So you went to dinner last night, you had your favorite pasta, or maybe you had a heavy spicy meal and it left you, get the tea.com. Maybe you mowed down a huge steak and your plumbing is all plugged, get the tea.com. Our super strength tea will take care of your occasional, it's all organic and non-GMO. Get rid of, we have so many great supplements, but our super tea is number one, get the tea.com. That's get the tea.com. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fate to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Go back, Lee Teppy. Hey, can we talk about something serious for a minute? Your age. Getting old has its perks. But remember, being a few years younger... You know, your hair was thicker, you didn't have so many wrinkles, that extra weight wasn't haunting you, and you just felt better. Well, we can't turn back the clocks and go back 10 or 15 years, but you can start feeling and looking 10 or 15 years younger with Nature's Youth RSF. It's a doctor-formulated daily supplement that helps your body maintain its peak performance and fight the aging process. Imagine sleeping better, looking better, and feeling better. See how Nature's Youth RSF has helped thousands of people just like you at naturesyouth.com. Naturesyouth.com. The holidays are coming. Imagine how it will feel when your family and friends are asking you what you did to look so good. Your secret will be Nature's Youth RSF. It's time to start looking better and feeling better. Learn more and order your Nature's Youth RSF at naturesyouth.com. That's naturesyouth.com. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Got to thank William Henry. That was an amazing conversation. Man, I learned so much tonight. WilliamHenry.net. All the information is right there. All of his books, the tours, and all of his research. It's right there at WilliamHenry.net. And he had mentioned, uh, and I'm going to get to this in just a second, and I'll get to uh, some phone calls here. Um, the weaponization of space and secret space programs and what's going on up there. And there was a press release uh, that just came out on that. And I'm going to get to that in just a bit. It's pretty interesting. And uh, so before I do, let's uh, go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Hey, this is uh, Dustin from Texas. Hey, Dustin from Texas. What's up, Jimmy? Hey, man, good show. I really enjoyed it. I think it's awesome that you can get the same guests on there and always keep it interesting. Well, that's, um, it's, it's easy. <laughs> it's easy when you have uh, somebody like William, man. Trust me. Yeah, he sounds like a cool guy. Um, I just, I wish you would took a couple questions. I wanted to ask him if, if he um, knows anything about, you've had him on the show one time, da- uh, Damon T. Berry, and the guy who did the knowledge of the forever time. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, I was just curious if he's, you know, touched touched the pyramids like he said he did and felt the knowledge and the power that Damien did. Well, actually, and it's it Dustin, it's funny that you asked that because we did discuss that once and this is the thing. This is what he told me and and his wife Claire also said the same thing. That we are all. Now, now I want you to just open up your mind for a second, okay? Oh, it is. We are all descendants from Egypt. 
and uh, you know reincarnated, right? And so when you go to Egypt, um, you will connect with a sacred site there. You don't know what it is. You don't have any idea until you you walk through that door, you walk through that entrance of a temple, you walk on some type of uh, a sacred area. And then when you connect with whatever it is, you will, your head will explode, right? Mm. It, it, you will, you will have that divine moment. And this is what the both of them told me. They do so many tours there that they'll watch and they will see that same transformation eventually happen to everybody on the tour. You know, they'll, you know, because they visit all these different sites, right? And it's different for everybody. For Damon T. Barry, it was obviously the Sphinx, right? You know, he did, yeah. he did the face plant. <laughs> it's a great story. <laughs> um, and, and Claire and uh, uh, William have both told me the same thing. I can't remember which temple it was for Claire or which one for William, but they said that, that when, when, you, when you find it, it, you'll know it at that moment. So, yeah, absolutely. Wow. We've talked about it before. Um, I, Rita and I will be, uh, we'll be going to Egypt next year and I cannot wait. And I know that, uh, Rita and I have these connections there and I know exactly, uh, what, where, where she thinks, you know, and, and I've got my ideas too as well. And I can't wait to visit. I, I hope I'm not disappointed, you know. You walk and nothing uh, happens at the site where you think it's going to happen, and then you're somewhere else, and then boom, you know, it takes off. Have you been to Egypt? I have not. That is on my thanks to do list. <laughs> it has to be for everybody. You know, oh, it definitely is. It has to be. You know, Greece and Rome. I mean, the obvious things, and, and you know, of course, the UK and France and and Spain, you know, these are all extraordinary places. There's no doubt about that. I would love to go to Ur, you know, go Beckley Tepe, um, <laughs> you know, in these places. I'd like to go to Mars. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd like to go to Mars, too. That, <laughs> well, you know, sign up with Elon, man. You can, you might be able to do that in a couple of years. But, <laughs> but yeah, I think that Egypt uh, should be, uh, if, if not number one, it better be close to number one. Uh, for everybody to go and visit, uh, you know, in this lifetime. Oh, it is. It is for me. Thank you so much, Dustin. Be Behave and be oh. well. Oh, no problem. Thank you, Jim. We'll see you tomorrow night. Bye. Yeah, that's a great. See, right there, if you think about it, that's a real fade or not that listens to the shows that is up on their game and knows exactly what's going on. <laughs> I love those kind of phone calls. Three two three eight two five five zero four five, or three two three two seven five nine six nine five. Um, what I would like everybody to do tonight, I know you know you're taking your notes, and we were getting our our, our knowledge on tonight. But Ed Fu, okay, that's it. Ed Fu, E D F U. And it's right there on the Nile in the Assyrian uh, temple. Go and do the research there. And check out uh, not only the construction. It's 300 B.C. Um, when it was built. Three, 300, maybe a little older. But right there, 300 B.C. But what they did there, and we talked about this on the show, but I need you to understand. This is what happened. They uh, they had been given that uh, that dynastic period had been given some documentation on the history of Egypt. Now at 300 BC, uh, and to have uh, Dynasty Zero sit at 3100 BC allegedly. Now we are talking about 2800 years. 2,800 years. The United States is 250 years old. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Right? And so they were given that. But the the papyrus was damaged. Okay? It was damaged. And because it was damaged, they wanted to, before it fell apart, they wanted to get the history of Egypt documented. Now, 
and not only covered that 2,800-year period, but it went back again tens of thousands and tens of thousands of years before that. And in this reference, and this is on the walls in, at the Temple of Edfu, Temple of Horus, um, uh, a reference to an island nation where the enlightened beings came from that founded Egypt. Now think about the the implications of that. And nobody wants to talk about it. And it's right there. It's carved in stone. And it's very clear. And what um, what William just said, and it's the best thing that anybody could say, this is not old. It's 300 B.C. So the writing, the hieroglyphics, the way that it's written, and the, and, and, and the language there is very, very clear. You don't have to interpret this. It is very clear. The story is clear. And and it's 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 right there. So if you really want a fascinating research project to do for the next twenty four hours, you really want to go down the rabbit hole. Ed Fu, Ed Fu will blow your mind. And when you go look at the pictures, look at the size and the beauty of that temple. Look at it; it's absolutely incredible. But it was there. Um, uh, and part of the temple was to document the history of Egypt, and it's right there. Okay, let's go to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Who's calling? Debbie from Sacramento. Hi, Debbie from Sacramento. How are you? Good. Hi, Jimmy. Well, the first caller actually took my question. Um, he asked it. I also wanted to know if William had ever touched any part of the Sphinx or the pyramids or anything, but you answered that. Um, so I'll just... I'll just add one other thought. Um, Everyone that I know, and myself included, has this weird gut feeling that they're somehow connected to Egypt. Um, And you don't know where that feeling comes from. So I agree. I think it's also from reincarnation, and everyone has originated from there at some point. Well, not originated, but had a lifetime there. And um, I think it was David Wilcock that said, that um, there are more people on the planet today than there ever have been, which means that every soul that's here now um, has been here already. They're all living here again now. Right. And that's kind of an awesome thought. And he said, and that's, and he explains, that's why the ascension process is happening now, because we're all going to get the opportunity to find out all these mysteries and go through the ascension process, which I think is fascinating. Yeah, and and the numbers, uh, when you look at it like that, it's one of the most fascinating statistics uh, that there are, right? And so just think about that for a second, that everybody that ever lived can now occupy a body at the same time, right? 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 Think about that for a second. That's pretty heavy, that's a pretty heavy thought, and that's where we are today. I know the first time that I – that was one of those things. It's like the first time somebody said to me, hey, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, could the universe be in, in uh, a cell on my thumbnail, and then there's another universe inside of there just like us? Well, you know, and you're smoking weed for the first time, and you're like, wow. <laughs> Well, you know, the, so the first time I heard that statistic, it hit me kind of like that. Wow, that is a pretty heavy thought that everybody mm-hmm. that That's, ever lived yeah. could now actually occupy a living body. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty yeah. heavy thought. Well, and thank you for tripping me out. That was cool. Well, trip me out. Thanks for having William here on. He was just he was He's the best. He's always. the best. Um, are you going to come down for the Conscious Life Expo? I'm sure going to try to, but, you know, now on the bucket list, i got to put Egypt on there for sure. And, you know, if it were a tie between Egypt and um, Rennes-le-Chateau, boy, it would be neck and neck. But if I had to choose one, and I desperately want to do both, um, I guess I'd have to pick Egypt because I'd want to go touch something. Well, <laughs> see, I connect. yeah, I know, I know. And if I had all the time in the world, right, you would have to, and I don't know what order you would put this in, Egypt first, right? But then you have things mm-hmm. like the south of France. You have the UK. You have Ireland. Uh, you have all of France, really. Um, you have uh, Greece. You have Rome. You have Malta, 
right? All of the islands in Greece and the Mediterranean all have some kind of crazy Greek temple on it that is, you know, 2,000 years old. So you have, um, uh, what about Crete? What about Cyprus, right? Mm -hmm. There there are so many different places all around. And, of course, then you have Jerusalem, you know, I'd like to go to Baalbek, uh, Lebanon, and, and check out those stones. You know, so what do you do with a list like that? We're not even throwing in, like, the Great Wall of China. That would be pretty, pretty bleeping epic. You know, so I, yeah. you know, I, don't, I don't know what to do here. But you can start. Well, you know, you, can, oh, star- you okay. can start with the Conscious Life Expo. That's pretty easy. Yeah, that's true. Well, let me just add one thing real quick. I'm so glad that your listeners and people like this are enlightened and, and speaking truth because the saddest things is one of my best friend. He's been to Crete, all his places. He's seen Stonehenge, all of it. And I was so excited that he was going to go to Stonehenge and I wasn't able to go. I'm like, oh, you know, how was it? And I was just, you know, tripping because of everything that we know. And I'm trying to share this stuff with him because it's just a pile of rocks. Right. You know, he, knew- he, he was so unaffected by all of it. And it was just, so sad. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I knew you were going to say that. I just knew. <laughs> you just want to grab him and shake him, don't you? Just like I know. shake I some know. sense but, into him. Well, the mystery of life is an exciting thing. And um, anyway, so. Thank you so much, Deb. And we'll see you tomorrow night on the show. Okay. Thanks, Jimmy. Have a good one. Yeah, you Bye-bye. too. Have a great night. Um, back to, yeah, Absolutely. You know, I have had the same experiences with people where they're well, you know, yeah, it was it was it was cool, but you know, yeah, I just want to just grab them and shake them. You have an opportunity like that. Well, okay, now talking about the secret space program. Now I talk about the X thirty seven B here all the time. There's if you want if that if we know about the X thirty seven B going up there for a year or two at a time. Um, on secret Air Force missions, and you want evidence of a secret space program, you have that right there. And I've talked about, if you just look at the X-37B by itself and the amount of designers and scientists and engineers of of flight controllers, um, mission scientists, uh, the research that they are doing, if it is research, it could be something else, uh, that that is a huge huge operation with tons of black budget money involved. That is a secret space program. And that's what we know about. That's the part that we know about. What is it that we don't know about? And when we talk about weapons in space, and I mentioned this uh, uh, last week, is this, the country that owns space is who's going to win any war. Everything is tied to GPS. You, not only you have guidance of weapons, but you have all of the flight control. You think about how many planes are over uh, uh, a battle zone at any time, any affected area, that the, the control that needs to go there. Then you have every single soldier on the ground and every tank. Everything is GPS and controlled and monitored and and communication systems, right? So it's all done by satellite. So up there, if they need to uh, take out somebody else's satellite, would they do it? Of course they would. There's not supposed to be weapons in space. Yes, there are. There are lots and lots of weapons in space, and they are not going to talk about it. What are those weapons? Is it plasma beams? Is it lasers? Is it kinetic? Is it machine guns, cannons, uh, maybe uh, some kind of crazy battle robot satellites that just fly into other satellites and take it out? Remember, all you have to do is spin one of them, take it out of orbit, and then it's done. You don't necessarily have to destroy it. You only have to touch it. So think about that. Well, to make all of that possible... Right now, not only GPS, but the military, the Air Force Space Command operates roughly 80 satellites. That's an eight and a zero, 80 satellites. And you may not know it, but the uh, the uh, Air Force uh, Space Command is the group that makes sure that Google Maps works on your cell phone. 
Now think about this, and I've talked about it on uh, not only uh, Pokemon Go, right? If you go uh, before Google Maps, Google Maps, Google Satellite is uh, a Pokemon Go. It's the same company, okay? The same CEO for both. That CEO was originally funded back before Desert Storm, the first Desert Storm in 1991, was funded by the CIA. All of this technology, all of it, the secret space program, X-37B, Google Maps, the Air Force Space Command, the satellites, all of this, not only does it trickle down to our daily life, but this has been going on for a long time. The command operates all 24 to 33 satellites in the GPS constellation for the entire world. Although China is working to build their own GPS network of 30 satellites, but China's GPS system is our GPS system. If we want to turn them off, we can. Think about that. Now, the Air Force uh, Space Command also tracks 23,000 objects in orbit, 1,400 of which are active satellites using ground-based radar. If the Space Command detects a possible collision, they notify the satellite owners, regardless of what country or company the satellites belong to. We own space, the United States. America's increasing reliance on all of the satellites makes us ripe for an attack. The United States has enjoyed essentially unchecked control of orbital domains for almost 50 years. Now, while other nations are starting to catch up, I'm speaking about China uh, specifically, and of course, Russia, but there are India, Pakistan, Japan, uh, the United Kingdom, France, all Brazil, they all, Ethiopia, has a space division. Yes, they do have a satellite up there in space. But the the next war is going to be won in, in, in space. There's no doubt about it. And if you don't think we have weapons up there and a secret space program dedicated to it, you're lying to yourself. There are ways. And uh, the Air Force won't get into operational details on what they can or cannot do up there. But they are protecting and defending capabilities from everything, from low-end reversible jamming all the way up to other kinetic-type devices. And when I say kinetic, kinetic is the military's word for, you know, missiles, bullets, you know, cannons, stuff like that. In this case, it means destroying a satellite with a weapon that physically smashes into it like a bullet smashes into a satellite it doesn't have to be a satellite smashing into a satellite although that technology is inevitably in play right but right now the uh, the air force is literally saying they are not going to talk about it but it is safe to assume that such capabilities exist they're not already discussed and they're not already designed they exist now think about it. And kinetic weapons are a small part of what they are dealing with right now. They've got to have something else in play, like laser weapons. You know, there's got to be something else. EMP weapons take out a satellite system with directed pulses. All of this is in play right now, orbiting up there in space. And trust me, if you want to take us down really quick, knock out our GPS system. Think about that for a second. Uh, everything that we have in the military today, everything that we have is satellite dependent. And it doesn't matter what it is, whether it's an APC, some kind of armored uh, vehicle for for uh, soldiers to ride around in, to tanks, you know, Humvees, the, the very basics of the basics, to guided missile frigates and and missile cruisers um our air force the planes the the uh the carriers the submarines all of this is controlled by satellites every aspect of it every marine has got a gps system tied to his back so think about it everything that we have would be rendered nearly useless if our satellites are taken out 
So therefore, we have the defensive capabilities built in right now. There have been rumors, and and again, I understand what William is saying and others, but there have been rumors about Russian uh, Gatlin gun satellites up there for 20 years. And the documentation is out there. You can go out there and read it yourself. They have been testing those weapons, and they are up there. And you have to assume that they are there. You have to. All right. Now, with that, there was something else. Oh, 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 I wanted to get this out there. The FBI agents, uh, the shooter in, in Texas of the church, cannot crack his phone. They can't crack his phone. Uh, Devin Patrick Kelly, they, they get his phone. He was texting right up until his death in his car, right? So they get the phone. The, the FBI won't tell us what kind of phone it is, if it's an iPhone or if it's an Android. But no matter what, they can't unlock it. They tried. The phone is now shut off. They sent it to Quantico. All of the information there, all of his texting and everything, out, all of that information that was out there, they can't get to. They can't crack his phone so i thought i found i just found that funny after uh san bernardino i would have thought that all of this was uh uh something simple to do now uh one other thing i want to leave you with tonight and we'll discuss all of this tomorrow night on fade to black talking about weapons in space and what we know about it was announced today in a press release that lockheed martin is now testing laser weapons on fighter jets now, this is what we know about. Again, we've got to always go back and revisit this this thought, this frame of mind. If they tell us about the technology, then it's already done. And it's been done and solidified for decades. All right? But now they are announcing that they are literally testing laser weapons on fighter jets. And you know where this is going on. It's going on out at Area 51, and the the thought immediately comes to mind, will we be able to see this testing going on? And I'm talking about from a passing car. You know, maybe you're in Las Vegas. You know, you're out looking at the skies. Will you see a laser weapon being tested on another target? Can you go out on the extraterrestrial highway out there next to Area 51, maybe go to the Alien, go to Rachel, Nevada, and kick back and see one of these fighter jets testing a laser weapon. Now think about that. If they are telling us about this now, I, I'm I'm just going to just say that I, I think that they've already been used. But if that is the case and the testing is there, we will see evidence of the testing. Are they going to show us film? Are we going to see video? of a laser weapon on a fighter jet. Man, 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 think about that. That just absolutely, 100% blows my mind. And that concludes another episode of Fade to Black. I want to thank William Henry for coming in strong tonight. It was uh, one of the best conversations I've had with William, like in ever. Fascinating. Tomorrow night is Fader Night. John Rappaport's going to be here. Open lines all night long. Thursday night, best night of the week. Fade to Black's executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark T. Culver, LJ3, Renee Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar, Fady by Dale, Webmaster Drew, The Geek, Music, Doug Aldridge, Intro, Space Boy, SpaceboyMusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and syndication is KGRA, the planet. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2017 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. Until tomorrow night, I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. I want everybody to be safe. Go Backley Tappy. Tappy.